social distancing, you say. The future is watching. Welcome to Opcode Virtual Summit. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome back for a second edition of uh, so vir the virtual summit of Opcode. Uh, so if there is any issue, let me know now so I can fix it. Uh, this is live, so doing the DJing uh, in real time. Uh, well, thanks again for joining us again today. Uh, like I was saying last time, I was not sure to do a second one, and there is a second one. This time, this is pretty much sure that we're also going to have a third one. So this is uh, something that's going to be uh, pretty recurring. Uh, the period of two, we uh, two weeks between like each edition has nothing to do with the uh, confinement extension that keeps being an increase of two weeks every two weeks. But uh, that's uh, an interesting coincidence, if you're all wondering. Um, so let's check uh, what's going to be our agenda today. So before we start, uh, like I was saying basically last time, but uh, before we used to be a physical conference and two weeks ago we did our first like virtual summit. And uh, for, for that, you know, like uh, if you have any questions, because this is live, you can just like drop a comment uh, in the YouTube chat or also on, uh, you on, uh, on Twitter if you're using the hashtag Upcode 2020. It should also appear in the corner. It's all working well. Oh, thank you, Laura. Like, uh, I appreciate it. Um, we have a lot of people actually uh, watching from a bit uh, everywhere. So uh, we have people from uh, from Kenya. I think we also gonna have some uh, people from uh, Ghana and Ivory Coast also watching. Uh, it's a great opportunity at least uh, now that you can uh, attend conferences without, uh, without having to go to, to the US and uh, F uh, frankly, even from uh, Middle East or Europe, you know, it's always a long flight to go to the US or to travel around. And uh, it's always like very time consuming to, to, to do all that travel. So at least that's one good thing that comes uh, out uh, from, from the, the uh, confinement. Uh, if you want to join the IRC channel, uh, we also have an IRC server. Uh, you're more than welcome to, uh, to join it. And as usual, so the slides will be available on GitHub. And uh, right after uh, the conference, they should be online. And uh, I think last time also someone was asking if we're going to cut uh, each presentation. So we will cut it and uh, we'll like, extract them out. But the live uh, like stream will be available anyway right after. And uh, that's, uh, that's it uh, for today. Before we start looking at the agenda, uh, a small uh, public announcement. Uh, so we uh, also partnered at Come with uh, Tetris uh, because they have their own idea and they make it available to uh, all uh, hospitals. So Tetris is a French uh, cybersecurity uh, company. So we partner with them uh, to assist like hospitals for free. This is part of uh, an initiative launched by uh, OVH called the uh, Open Solidarity. And uh, if you haven't checked it out yet, uh, you should also go on the uh, CTI League website. So this is the Counter Threat Intelligence uh, uh, League. And uh, because of the pandemic, obviously, there is also a lot of cyber attacks, as we all know, that are like proliferating uh, right and left. So the CTI League uh, is basically like focusing on helping uh, companies by like uh, gathering people for like uh, to monitor disinformation, incident responders and security experts. Uh, I'm sure like more will come uh, about it because it is, this is a very recent initiative, but definitely something you should keep an eye on. And if you know like any uh, medical institution uh, having troubles and we want to reach out so you can either like check out the Open Solidarity or like the CTI uh, League. And uh, if you have any question, you can just uh, send us an email uh, d directly. Um, so. Our agenda for today, uh, we're going to have uh, Ryan Naren, uh, who is uh, Director of uh, Security Strategy at Intel, who is going to uh, give us a keynote about the uh, cycle of innovation. So that should be pretty interesting. I'm looking forward to that, uh, that keynote. Uh, I mean, may maybe Ryan will tell uh, the, the background story, but uh, this is actually the, the third time I'm inviting him for an Opcode uh, keynote. 
the first two time uh, unfortunately he could not uh, make it but i'm glad that at least this time he can make it um and uh following the the keynote we're gonna have a discussion panel with uh so uh Gurk, uh, we, who does not need an introduction and uh, sarah jen uh, terp from uh, the cognitive security group uh, so they have been doing a lot of work on uh, misinformation and uh, brian pendleton also uh, with uh, a visiting professor uh, also like uh, specialized in misinformation and uh, we're gonna discuss uh, what's going on with this information now or complex it is and that it's not only like twitter bot and just like uh, facebook uh, ads and uh, after that we're gonna have uh, kostin from uh, kaspersky from the great team who is going to be speaking about how you can tap your own uh, home network since everyone is working uh, remotely from home now uh, you can be sure that a lot of apt groups are also going to change their strategy uh, in how they're going to be targeting people and even with uh, enterprise you know like people working from home uh, will also very likely be compromised. So that should be like pretty interesting also. And uh, last but not least, uh, after all the buzz that uh, happened around Zoom and security vulnerabilities uh, last week, so Patrick accepted to give a presentation about his latest uh, blog post to explain uh, what was going on with Zoom, the vulnerabilities he has found, and uh, I think they were patched quite uh, quickly by uh, by uh, by Zoom, so that's also should be like very uh, very interesting. Uh, let me check. Uh, so now I think uh, we can uh, get ready, uh, Ryan. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. So you're, oh, yeah. Can you hear me, Ryan? No, I think uh, Ryan went to warm up some tea. <laughs> When? I can hear you, Matt. Am I up now? Uh, yeah, yeah. You can. Uh, oh, this share. is the first time I'm hearing you in the Zoom, so it's a little complicated trying to listen in another machine that's way behind. So. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, no worries. Am uh, I up now? Yeah, yeah. You can share your screen now. And I will just put you uh, put you next. Can you tell me when I'm live? Uh, you are now. Good morning, everyone. Good evening, good night, wherever you are. I hope that you're wearing a mask and um, uh, locked in, staying safe, checking on your neighbors, checking on the elderly. Uh, Matt called this a keynote. He's been trying to get me to come out to Opcode in Dubai for a, a keynote for a long time. I don't believe in keynotes. I hate that word. First of all, I don't belong on the stage with the Grog, Sarah Jean, Costin, and Patrick Wardle, um, but I did have a really interesting experience recently in San Francisco that tripped my mind into thinking about the way security is handling its uh, generational handoff. Um, security has grown up, it's time for a generational handoff and we seem to be muffing it and, and there are some uh, implications for it for cybersecurity. So I wanted to just kind of share my shower thoughts on this, um, uh, not in a keynote format, don't expect to learn anything. I'm not gonna uh, 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 release anything groundbreaking. Uh, this is just to get your mind wrapped around thinking about how uh, how you fit into the security industry. And if you're a security leader, how do you uh, embrace the next generation uh, within this context of what I'll talk about, this uh, cycle of innovation. So my name is Ryan Narayan. I work on security strategy at uh, Intel. Uh, prior to this, I was a security journalist for many years working at eWeek, ZDNet. I created Threat Post when I went over to Kaspersky Lab. And I worked at Kaspersky managing the security research team in the US. Uh, strongly recommend the presentation coming up later by Kostin Rayu, who used to be my manager. I saw this research in action uh, when he first started it and I can highly recommend it. 
Um, all right, let's get into it. So I was in San Francisco for RSC. And on the Monday of RSC, I had a CISO on conference type event. I was doing, uh, uh, hanging out with some CISOs and sharing experiences and sharing war stories. And someone asked me to, uh, if I had a, a tweezer. And I was like, no, I don't, what am I gonna do with a tweezer? So on the way to the conference, I stopped at Walgreens. So in the US, Walgreens is one of those big massive drugstores that are on every other corner here. And I went in there to buy a tweezer and I know nothing about tweezers. So I'm in the section with the tweezers and there's this lady is trying to help me understand what tweezers are. And she's giving me the history of tweezers and she's helping me understand what types there are and why I need this type and that type. And I'm inundated with information and it dawned on me right there and then that, oh my God, this woman who doesn't have any interest or any, uh, she has no, uh, 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 Selling this tweezer isn't going to make or break her day or her life. Uh, but she did spend five, a good five to 10 minutes telling me about the different types of tweezers and so on. And it, it, it was a really fascinating conversation and really a pleasant, kind experience. And I walked out of there thinking to myself, what am I going to do with all this tweezer information? This woman was really, really kind and wanted to uh, make sure I knew everything I wanted, that I, uh, everything I needed to know before I bought my tweezer. So I figured out what am I going to do with this tweezer information? I'll share it with you. So here's a, a quick side note that has nothing to do with this talk. There are six main types of tweezers. There's all kinds of tweezers. There's a unique use for each type of tweezer. You have to choose wisely. So this woman went on and on telling me about all these things, just genuinely interested in my curiosity about this topic. And the most important lesson I got there is not just learning about tweezers, but I learned about her patience, her consideration, her kindness, and the empathy she had for transferring this knowledge she had. She genuinely wanted me to learn about tweezers, knowing fully well that I had very, very little interest in really, really knowing about tweezers. And what does this have to do with security? Um, I walked out of there thinking to myself, what if we all uh, were what if we all adopted the attitude of someone selling a tweezer and genuinely wanted to share everything we knew with someone else, even though they um, Matt, can you hear me? Are the slides moving? Because I'm looking at the YouTube feed and it's way, way behind. Ah, there we are. I'm sorry, okay. I'll just ignore that screen then, sorry guys. Uh, so what does this have to do with security? I wanted to point out a couple of dates to you. The first cybersecurity patent was issued in 1983. MIT was granted this patent for cryptographic communication system. Um, uh, gosh. DEF CON dates back to 1993. Jeff Moss did DEF CON in 1993. That's almost 30 years ago. FRAC 49, one of the most famous FRAC issues was published in 1996. That's the one with smashing the stack for fun and profit. Uh, the first introduction to, you know, memory, buffer overflow, memory corruption, exploitation. SSL protocol, which actually gave us the, 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 the inter internet protocol that made it safe for us to do basic things like shopping online security was released in 1995. If you look around, they're now writing books about the CDC and Loft, all those little researchers and young researchers that I covered as a security reporter back in the days, they're now CISOs, global security leaders, running major, major things. My point is security has reached that tipping point where in the 1990s when DEF CON was emerging and FRAC was emerging and SSL gave us uh, safe online browsing, uh, that was a generation ago. It, it was a generation ago and those folks who created and kind of built the foundation for it have either moved on, they've aged out or uh, they're sticking around. And now what I find is that there's a, a fantastic tension existing now uh, between, uh, between generations as we figure out this cycle of innovation. So now that security has grown up, I wanted to share uh, one of the most fascinating articles I've read on this cycle of innovation. And I copied and pasted everything verbatim here, um, just to be quite clear. And in this, in this piece, Nick Hutton argues that to find the next big thing, you have to go back to the future. And he goes through this cycle of innovation. 
that starts with, you know, applying technology to age old problems. Smart people spend a lot of time, solution falls short and, it, and it, this cycle. And the most important part here is that this, 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 this takes about 20 to 30 years, this kind of interest cooling. It all kind of fits perfectly within this period of a career. Uh, this attempt to fail, stigmatize the decay curve that, you know, the new generation perhaps doesn't feel the stigma, but this 20 to 30 year cycle just keeps appearing and reappearing. We're at the 25, 30 year mark. We are right at that point where there's a generation handoff that's uh, looming. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some of these tensions I'm noticing in this generational handoff. Uh, a couple of things to keep in mind is uh, some just basic uh, uh, uh. Check, check, one, two. Sorry, sorry, Matt. A couple of things to keep in mind is just what's happening with generations. There's an older, older generation uh, that's living longer. Uh, uh, technology has expanded. Uh, digital re revolution and evolution has kind of created more and more roles. So there's an older generation hanging on to security leadership roles longer and longer. There's a next generation of security leaders that are waiting their turn, but they're not quite happy about this kind of wait your turn thing. Uh, because what they are running into is gatekeeping, gatekeeping in not so subtle places, a lot of blocking out of uh, non-traditional people, a lot of ageism exists on both sides where the young folks think that the older folks have aged out and doesn't understand newer technologies. And on the, on the other side, there's a lot of, oh, we, already, we already solved that problem. We discussed that for years and years. And I see this happening on Twitter and on the public conversations all the time. Uh, someone will post something on Twitter about a vulnerability res uh, responsible disclosure discussion and the wrath of the older generation just bounces to remind them that we've had these conversations since the 1990s and the 2000s. And, uh, uh, and, and it's just this, this kind of gatekeeping ageism is just so destructive to what we're trying to do that we need to understand that the size of these generations adds a really, really ominous wrinkle. And there's a coming generational uh, vacuum in uh, leadership vacuum in technology. And more specifically in security, I wanted to share a quote from Gabriel Bosch, a, a writer and a speaker who covers the millennial generation very well. And she makes the argument that there just aren't enough generation Xers to take over from the older generation. And that means that many, many management positions will be empty, many more will be filled by people who are not properly prepared for this. And my argument is that at a time when these facts exist, we should do less and less about this gatekeeping and understand that as much as we contributed, uh, when I say we, I'm talking about my generation contributed, we did okay. Uh, there's a lot for us to be proud of. Uh, the foundation of uh, computing feels shaky, but it's there, it's there. Uh, we, we continue to do very, very crucial, important things uh, with the technologies we built. Uh, I, you know, you can go to the supermarket, look at your smartphone, click a button, stare at it, and then there's some biometrics magic that happens in the background that moves money from your bank to the retailer. That is a result of a lot of the, you know, foundational technologies that we as an industry created and built. Uh, we had an opportunity to, to use the creation of smartphones and the emergence of the smartphone industry to rethink security and we used it well. We created sandboxes, we created new models around app stores and code signing and so on. So we, there's a lot of innovators who move the needle and a shout out to them, but let's keep it real. If you look at uh, Google's OD uh, tracker, memory corruption still dominates uh, OD exploitation. Again, Frog 49 was in 1996 when this was first raised. So we still have a lot, a lot of problems to solve. Everywhere, every news publication has the news of a data breach in some day. It's just so weary and tiresome now that uh, sometimes I wonder if it's even worth reporting it. Uh, ransomware attacks against hospitals, which is like the, the, the lowest of the low still exist and still everywhere. They are now attacking critical infrastructure. 
Austin will talk about why he's looking for nation state attacks and his own network because they're everywhere. So as much as there's a lot for us to be proud of as a generation, we haven't done half uh, the amount of work that needs to be done and there's still a ton to be done. And my point is that we need to, as an industry, remember the lessons I got from the tweezer lady, which was a lot of empathy and consideration for what I wanted, um, uh, a lot of patience. And for me, my, uh, uh, my, 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 my parting message to you is that this a smooth handoff has to be crucial. We have to show empathy and consideration. We have to pursue not wait for kids to ask us, but we need to, as adults, pursue mentorships and pursue uh, uh, finding apprentices for apprenticeships, feel, uh, uh, be energized about sharing. Uh, we need to approach real, true, meaningful diversity that has meaning and we need to understand what that word actually means. My suggestion is to start with gender. Andy Ellis was on my podcast recently talking about diversity and his thing was, okay, gender is one that we can define pretty easily. Let's start there. Uh, you know, hire more women, invest in more young ladies in technology, uh, invest in non-traditional geographies, shout out to Matt Swish um, and Opcode for all the stuff they've done in this area, which is just fantastic and fascinating to me. If you can help locally in your area, do it. This handoff is happening as we speak. Security is older and, and getting into this place where we need to do this handoff. And it's crucial that we all play a role in understanding these generational shifts and habits. There's a lot you know, we can dig into. Um, I don't know if that qualified as a keynote. That, those were my shower thoughts on, on where we are as an industry and some worrying things that I'm noticing. Please remove your gatekeepers. Please embrace the kids. Please feel free to help the kids. It's important. Uh, my DMs are open. Reach out. Um, if you can help as, as, as a mentor and as someone who can help with this generational handoff in a smoother way, uh, please do. Thank you very much, Matt, for the opportunity to, to present to your audience. And everyone, please continue to wear your masks. The, thank you, Ryan. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Of course, of course. I think uh, the chat, if you guys have any questions, you can ask now. But I think Brian uh, had, had a question now. You can unmute yourself, uh, Brian, if you want to discuss. Uh, the thing about Generation uh, X, because I don't want to paraphrase it uh, uh, improperly. Yeah, I I was just saying, um, as as a Gen Xer and, and having lots of friends in that, I, uh, it, I see a lot of them deciding they don't want management positions. They, they have decided, hey, if you've held out this long on me, just give it to the next person. I'm going to go on and do something else. There is a lot of that happening, and that's that's what's leading to this paucity of leadership that's coming. Um, uh, there's just not enough Gen Xers to take the, the spaces. So it, it, in reality, we just there's no other option, right? I mean, but if if your argument is that Gen Xers are are, are turning away from leadership roles and passing it along, then that adds a, a, another layer of another wrinkle on top of it. I don't know that that's happening. Well, also, you have to keep in mind that uh, because I know like uh, when I first moved to the US, it was a big shock. It's like most of tech companies and you have two tracks, they have a technical track and a management track. Uh, so you can still stay technical and be like an IC or like still uh, like be a distinguished engineer. Whereas like in France, it's almost uh, impossible. You know, you have to become a manager after you cannot stay an engineer all your life. So I'd be interested to see how that happens culturally across the world as well. Like, Cause I agree with you about that happening in the U S yeah. uh, what I do find though, is that there's a lot of, um, like I mentioned in my talk, uh, uh, a lot of the folks I wrote about as security researchers back in the day are now CISOs. Um, you know, you look around and you look at Charlie is running security at uh, Cruise. Dino is doing security at, yeah. uh, at, at square window. Snyder is at, uh, uh, at Square, there's a bunch of these guys who have taken on uh, taken on a lot of these leadership roles, and I think I think there's more of an interest in that happening. More. Yeah, yeah, this is true. Uh, Can you read the questions if there are any? Because I can't I can't scroll through the chat. Yeah, no, no, I will read the questions. Uh, so far, there is no question, but uh, yeah, like for those uh, we're not familiar with Ryan, uh, I would say like 15 years ago, like Ryan was one of the uh, top uh, cybersecurity journalists. So that's why he says like a lot of them now became uh, 
you know, like CISOs or have like uh, executive positions now. Um, but uh, like, like you said, you know, I think it's very important to uh, that like the new generation to not be afraid of gatekeepers and to express their, their thoughts. You know, uh, I was a bit surprised also when you said like uh, a lot of them are scared to like, you know, uh, you know, to publish something on Twitter. Uh, even about bug bounties because or full disclosure because they're afraid of uh, people saying oh yeah we we covered that like 10 15 years ago so because of well, that the, they were not uh say, there's there was a this massive time. there's a massive culture clash between the old school hackers and the, the quote-unquote bug bounty kids who are doing cross-site scripting and so on. there's a there's a there's just a uh what is the word it's not necessarily a culture clash, but it's just like a disrespect. The older folks just have no respect for these kids doing XSS. Meanwhile, that's the, that's where all the breaches are happening. So there's this, I don't know, it, it, it bothers me. It bothers me to go online and see someone from the next generation, a younger generation asking a very, very valid question and just get constantly pounded because the question may have been answered 17 years ago by someone on a paper somewhere like that's just distressing uh, attitudes and that's what I'm calling attention to when if you go on Twitter and you see someone asking what in your opinion is a dumb question take a deep breath walk away get some coffee and just like scroll to the next tweet you don't need to bombard these kids with 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 your you know uh, dismissive attitudes that's 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 kind of my big beef these days yeah that that speaks to something else as well in that um as a community we have done very very poorly in organizing and making the corpus of information we've developed over the decades available to people in a clear way so you know it might have been something that was covered in a paper 17 years ago and everyone that was around 17 years ago remembers it because it's famous but everyone that's around from 15 years on has no idea. And that's a failure we have to own. Like we, we have completely failed to create a, a library and a, a corpus of like, these, these are things that you should know about because it will help you. Like we, we've put in the work already, like here are the shoulders of giants, go and see further. It's a, it's a fair point. That's actually there's uh, two people in the in the chat asking like, uh, is this a problem with our uh, own keeping of history? And is there a website or collection of links that anyone uh, can recommend with a lot of informative content? Um, but yeah, like uh, uh, yeah, John, John Snow is definitely right. Uh, we definitely did a poor job at uh, keeping like uh, and archiving everything. Um, but yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> That's the, the, we have the an opportunity to fix things too. Let's just not beat up ourselves. Like there's, we're, we we live in interesting times right now. We're almost kind of almost at a restart spot. We have an opportunity to start locally, start small, do things right, uh, use this, uh, this, use these times to think positively and, uh, and be more aggressive in fixing the things that we see as problems instead of constantly talking about problems. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, well, I don't think uh, there is uh, any more questions. Uh, well, thanks uh, for your presentation, Ryan. Uh, I hope it's going to motivate uh, a, a lot of people to carry on and uh, to keep learning and to not get discouraged because uh, we had this discussion a few times with some friends. Now, if you start to hacking now, it's not b like back in the... Uh, you know, when you had Windows 2000, where you could just like learn like few things there and there, and also there's like so much information and so many things to learn at the same time that it's very like difficult to know like where you can start. So I think it's important to uh, remind people to stay like motivated. But uh, yeah, well, uh, f thanks again, uh, thanks again, Ryan. And uh, so Absolutely. don't forget to send me your slides so I can put them on GitHub after. And uh, yeah, like uh, just a short uh, intermission and we will continue with our next presentation, which is going to be our panel discussion. Social distancing, you say. The future is watching. Welcome to Opcode Virtual Summit.
and uh, we are back. So thanks uh, for staying with us. I hope you uh, enjoy that uh, keynote uh, from Ryan. So for our next presentation, like I was saying, uh, we're going to be discussing uh, this information. Uh, and uh, as we have learned now uh, with, uh, with Ryan, uh, hackers are pretty bad at uh, documentation. And imagine that's uh, when we didn't really have uh, much information on the internet. So now that there is like so much uh, information, obviously, and uh, in the middle of that uh, pandemic, there is a lot of uh, disinformation and misinformation. Uh, we will also uh, see the difference between the two after during our, our panel. And uh, yeah, like uh, I guess uh, we, we can start. So uh, let me. Uh, can you uh, can you hear me, Sarah, Greg, and Brian? Uh, yep. Okay, yes. awesome. And yes, that is Asgard in the background. Nice. Eek. Let me move this here, here. Move that here. Okay, all good. So uh yeah i guess uh we, we can start uh well who wants to uh start uh, the the conversation sarah brian greg which uh which i always are? defer to sarah yeah sarah you you <laughs> you're by, by default <laughs> okay so yeah i suppose we'd better get the elephant out of the room first Let, let's have the fight about what disinformation is <laughs> uh, i i think we should open with the what we're going to be covering Oh, okay. And then, Go on, Jake. You do it. Yeah. Fine. Um, okay. So the the panel is called disinformation about disinformation, and uh, essentially what we want to do is we want to uh, broaden people's understanding of what disinformation is, because it seems quite a lot of the attention these days is focused on things like. Uh, Twitter bots or Facebook pages. And there's really just a huge amount out there that is um, sort of much more important in terms of actually driving how people perceive the world. So we're going to be covering uh, how misinformation and disinformation are not a limited phenomenon exclusive to Russia or China. And that a huge amount of disinformation does not even touch social media, that it actually comes from uh, authorities, celebrities, and the media. So, and corporations. We'll start up and, and corporations. So, we, we will start out by uh, beating up on Brian about the uh, definition of misinformation. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, w welcome so, to our virtual sitting room where we, we just have a chat about things between <laughs> ourselves. Yeah, yeah. So, the, so, Sarah? Yeah, the discussion we, we generally have is, you know, there are whole committees dedicated to defining what disinformation and misinformation are. I, I spend half my life avoiding being on those committees. So generally what we do is we just say, okay, here's a working definition. There it is. Now we go do the shit we need to do. So what we've done typically is said that misinformation is false content, whether it's text or images, uh, it's information of some, some form that's false. It's not necessarily malicious. It, it might be in my grandmother not knowing what my favorite color is. Um, it's people innocently passing on stuff they don't know is false. Whereas disinformation has two parts to it. It's a sense of intent that it's deliberately put out to be false, but that also it's beyond just the content. It's the falsehood may not be in the content at all. You, you can have a disinformation campaign with completely true information. We've, we've seen a lot of uh, disinformation campaigns focused on African-Americans and black communities in other countries where the information presented is completely true. It's just amplified. The amplification itself is false. The groups that are set up are false. The users who are pushing out that information are false. So the falsehoods are 
elsewhere with the production chains. That's where I come from on disinformation, misinformation. Yaga, your turn. I, and we're similar on that. It, it, to me, it, it, and what I've always, uh, you know, the way I always define misinformation is falsehood, but it is completely um, unmalicious. So if your mother says something wrong because she read it someplace else, that's spreading misinformation. Disinformation is the originator of it and what their intent is. So that that's where I really put it is it, the, the disinformation is in the intent part more than anything else. Whereas the misinformation, hey, I just picked it up and I keep running with it. Even un, until somebody tells me it's wrong. And then if I still keep running with it, n now I'm part of the problem as well. Yeah, that, that, that's fair. I think we actually just violently agreed. <laughs> <laughs> We've obviously been arguing about this enough now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so now that everyone's on board, uh, essentially this information is malicious with intent and misinformation is just being wrong, um, intentionally or not. That's like, what else? Well, I, let me hop in for let me hop in one thing. Uh, one thing that mm -hmm. Sarah uh, said, I think, is absolutely right, and a lot of people don't understand this. A good disinformation campaign is ninety five percent truth. A great disinformation campaign is completely true, and I've just changed up how the context is so that it is uh, it, you don't realize that. And you can even go verify that it's the truth, which reinforces the fact that, oh, I should believe this. I mean, really, good disinformation campaigns are just really good advertising. Yeah. Marketing methods yeah. applied. Yeah, it's, that's, that's why we use marketing models originally in the, the AMIT frameworks. That's why we fed them in. Sorry, Jay, uh, your turn. Well, no, I was, I was just going to say, like, um, if you look at pretty much any anyone who's put together laws of propaganda, they will almost always say, do not lie. Like, if, if you can avoid it, do not lie. And never lie by accident. You know, every, like, the, the more truth you have, the better. So, um, you know, from Goebbels saying, you know, do not lie, to the, uh, the British propaganda committees saying, you know, we will use the truth exclusively. Uh, unless, you know, it, it's to our benefit to, to not do that. Uh, even black propaganda was almost exclusively truth-based. Um, it's, it's far more powerful to give someone the truth, even if it's just a subset. That's, that's usually a, a very good way of doing it, is to just a, a partial truth is sufficient. And then as long as you frame it the right way, it can carry over literally everything you want. Um, so, mean, yeah. yeah, like. If you think about things like cheap fakes versus deep fakes, I mean, it's you know, quite often yeah. a cheap fake. Just using a real video uh, and messing with it is more effective <laughs> than taking the time to build something. Yeah, uh, uh, just, just to build on Ryan's point, I have written about this extensively. <laughs> Um, so the, the thing I want to move on to is like right now, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but we're kind of in this uh, pandemic time and one of the, one of the things that happens during a pandemic is my dog goes crazy and tries to break into my room. <laughs> but, uh, the, the other thing is like, because pandemics are, uh, on the one hand, they're, they're sort of starved for news. And on the other hand, they're full of bad news. So they become a, a very fertile environment for rumors because pretty much, um, you know, everyone likes to feel that they know something and they can share something new with other people. So it makes rumors spread very well. And in a time of widespread fear, there's, you know, a lot of space for 
people to come up with things that are, you know, they're terrifying or they sound good or so on. So the thing I wanted to bring up here is how, how are rumors about COVID going around? Like we, we've uh, got that huge list, Sarah, <laughs> that... Yeah, uh, <laughs> we've got a few lists now. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah um, I mean, one, one thing we've been doing is Cogset Colab have been collating all of the other lists of COVID-19 narratives. So narratives are the stories that people tell. Um, I guess we've got to explain that bit too. So what we tend to see is campaigns. So you see these large scale events or these large scale things that are being pushed. Uh, MH19, there are lots of um, disinformation instance around that. So you see a campaign with instance within it. COVID-19, uh, there are lots of smaller instance within that. And most of the instance have some form of narrative, some form of story, some form of meme that they, they sit on. So, and those memes underneath that, then you see the messages, you see the fake users, you see the fake linkages, you see the fake groups, uh, all the things that you see as a, you know, I'm a data scientist, so I see as a data scientist. But if you want to start dealing with these, you need to start tracking at the narrative level. So we've been collecting up um, lists of narratives and some of them are pretty wonderfully crazy. Um, there's lots of sort of China narratives, there's lots of health narratives. Um, one of the reasons that you get these is because there are information vacuums. So where there isn't good, um, reliable information at the top in a country, or there isn't a trusted source or set of trusted sources, then the bad guys will just sit, you know, step into that, throw, throw data in. Um, either you know, geopolitical aims, money aims. Uh, let me go hunt some of these down uh, whilst we talk amongst ourselves. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, like one, one point I had is that, um, you know, like basically China and Russia have not killed anyone with disinformation, but Trump has. You know, his, um, his big thing on uh, chloroquine led to at least uh, two people ingesting um, like basically a compound meant for fish, not for human consumption. And uh, it was a husband and wife. The husband died and the wife ended up basically being in ICU saying, uh, don't trust every anyone, not even the president, which to be fair, seems like something that you would have figured out in 2016, but you know, here we are. Um, so, you know, like, Disinformation, and I'm, I'm going to class that as disinformation rather than misinformation because I don't think he does anything that isn't malicious. Um, like disinformation can come from anywhere, and right now a lot of it is coming from the top. Like uh, it, it is coming from media sources or from companies or from um, you know politicians and that makes it particularly insidious because it's very hard to push back against. Like if it was just Twitter bots, you know, it would be easy. We could deplatform the Twitter bots. But um, when, when you have governors saying that they don't really need to do anything because they don't really believe that uh, COVID-19 is a threat, it's much, much harder to uh, counter that. Well, there have been long-running pipelines as well. Um, so we've been watching for, for years now um, stuff starting up in the chance, moving through uh, into the mainstream media and then st straight through the top levels back to back to public. So it, it's there are whole flows here to, to be dealt with. It's not just like a simple take out the bots and you're good. Right. But I guess this is the point of our discussion, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, and as we we talked about uh, b before this, um, yes, there is uh, sources of disinformation, misinformation coming from, uh, say, New York Times. We talked about that, uh, but like I said, where where do we expect them to step up and actually say 
these people are wrong. It's very hard for one entity to that's the size of New York Times to flat out say the president is wrong. Don't follow him, follow us, because it could very easily be looked at as now I'm going to be a source of misinformation or disinformation. Yeah, I mean, the politics of it is is hard. And then yeah. you have the, and now I find the truth. I and mean, we're seeing more um, groups. So the WHO has its own list of rumors and counters and um, true facts. But um, there, there are groups that have run through through disasters for quite a long time. So FEMA's run it way back. Um, hurricane lists of rumors. Uh, BuzzFeed has, has done this for a long time. Uh, now we're seeing the big orgs like WHO. We're seeing, I think Maryland just stood up uh, an information bureau. So we're starting to see that state level coming back. I don't know if we're going to get to a decent information bureau for the for the US, but this isn't just a US problem. We're dealing with information vacuums and a bunch of bad guys trying to lever into those vacuums at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I was going to say is you've, you've brought up WHO and right now they, so, they, they've had a little bit of a credibility problem this year because they have made some uh, possibly honest errors, but you know all sorts of things like where they have erased Taiwan, mm -hmm. um, you know first ignoring uh, ignoring the warning of uh, human to human transmission, and then the fairly famous video of the WHO representative basically pretending that they didn't hear a question about Taiwan and then you know logging off and so on so they, they're struggling a little bit with credibility and I believe it was well for me it was earlier today but I think in the US it was yesterday Trump has now started to directly attack WHO which is going to cause um, I, I would suspect a like that's that's his overt message to the um the various amplification channels to start generating their own you know what did who know and when did they know it you know how corrupt are who all of these other conspiracies and so on are going to be generated out of people taking their cue from that and it's going to have a knock-on effect just because you know that's how the information world works if you just if you create enough smoke, people suspect that there must be some fire somewhere. I think so, the truth is, yeah, hmm. the truth has always been a casualty of politics. And it, it's, you know, political spin has existed as long as I guess we've had humans. Well, and that's why, you know, our, our topic is, is disinformation isn't just all these other big sources. Uh, and, and what I try to focus on more is local disinformation and um, a lot of what we say uh, at, at like local levels. Take a look at, at local political campaigns, and this is across the world. Uh, what we call mudslinging are lies, but we just get into this habit of people going, oh, I, I understand what that is, but what it does is it makes you more susceptible to other types. You get used to that and you just start believing it is okay to do this, or if it's your cause, your politician, your whatever, you think it is okay to do that as long as it meets your needs. But you also get societies where carry-out enter holds. You don't get, I mean, where I come from, I'm, I'm obviously not American. Um, we have the Advertising Standards Association. There's actually a body set up to keep advertisers truthful. That I'm, I'm not really seeing an equivalent here. So how do you expect yeah. truthfulness to happen in a society where that isn't a, an expectation in the first place? Well, the problem there is Americans are really big on the First Amendment. And so, um, you know, to be fair, yes, free speech, absolutely a great thing. But that's a very broad, general, you know, principle. And when it gets down to like the nuts and bolts, and it means things like 
free speech means that you're allowed to lie about things. Okay, that's fair, but you know, we, we do actually have rules about stuff. Like you're not allowed to lie that, uh, you know, this mercury based drink is going to cure all of your problems. Therefore drink mercury. You know, like if, if you tried to advertise that you would be shut down very hard. Um, you know, you're, you're not allowed to sell quack medicines. You are limited in things like, um, what you can claim about foods. Right? So you can't say like, this is a fat free food if it's actually full of fat. Like, you know, you, you, you have free speech, but there are rules. So it would be entirely possible to put rules in place that say like, if you are advertising something, you know, not just that people eat, but like if you're advertising things, you're not really allowed to lie. Like you, oh. You're only allowed to lie a little bit. Well, one of the baseline lies is this product will make you sexy. You know, it's... <laughs> <laughs> well, no, and that's the truth. And, and this, this is something, uh, not just the U.S., this is worldwide. We have become used to advertising. And that it also makes us very susceptible, uh, in my opinion, uh, to uh, these disinformation and misinformation. Because every bit of advertising at a certain level is a little bit of misinformation. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the thing that's related to that is if you look at um, the, you know, now there's a lot of companies that are being set up to do disinformation and misinformation campaign. It's been commercialized, you know, like the, it's not just the IRA, there's a whole bunch of entities. And when you look at them, you know, like they're run by PR people, they're run by ad people, you know, these, um, they're, they're run by the experts in, you know, marketing lies to people. Isn't that the roots of the IRA too? I mean, that started as commercial. Uh, yeah. The... So... <laughs> well, you yeah, definitely that's... made a point I was going to, and that's that you can take a look mm -hmm. at, at a lot of the uh, masterminds behind campaigns going on right now, and they are PR people, advertising people, uh, because they understand that's they understand how to get people's attention and keep it and keep it focused on their message. Well, you're, you're also talking, I mean, it's not just uh, focus on message, but you're in group out grouping as well. So some of this again is about this narrative. Some of the narratives that people have are the stories about who you are and who you belong to and also who you don't belong to. So a lot of the interesting campaigns have been the ones that have been creating splits and creating chaos. It's not even about getting people to believe stuff. It's just about getting them to not like the guy over there. Yeah, uh, that's, that's an interesting point. And I, before we go into splitting groups, which I'd love to talk about, I just want to bring up that actually uh, a, a very fascinating uh, look at how, um, I'm sorry, I just read the line someone put in a note that said BJ in intensive care. And I thought that's a brilliant idea until I realized it means Boris Johnson. <laughs> yeah. Prime Minister, <laughs> England. Yes, is. Yes, okay, sorry. Um, I know right, what you so were thinking, Grog. <laughs> I think everyone does. Yeah, you can take um, the guy out of the brothel. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Look, so, um, one, one of the fascinating things is that actually, like the reason that Fox News and the sort of extreme right-wing media machine exists is that during the 80s, there was this move of identity politics that uh, Rush Limbaugh basically started with his uh, AM talk radio show. And that brought together like uh, Christians, like Southern racists, and um, some other right-wing conservative groups. And that suddenly actually created a advertising market, right? Like previously you'd have to have a, a different way of marketing to those separate groups. But now from a advertising point of view, they were all collected in one place. So they were easier to target with marketing and ads. And that created 
uh, that put money into the space and therefore more people got in. There was a need for more people to do this. And most of it started out not necessarily as um, right-wing perspectives of, you know, let's, let's do deep policy analysis of how we can reduce government to improve, you know, efficiency and blah, blah, blah. It was identity politics, right? They're, they're creating like, this is our identity. And that has increased over time. So it has become very much an identity statement. And that's one of the reasons why there hasn't been a corresponding uh, left-wing media empire, because you already have an identity as the, as the left-wing. You're someone who does not watch Fox, right? You don't need to be someone who does watch another thing. You simply have to be someone who doesn't watch Fox. So it's, you know, it, it's, again, an interesting thing about how there's in-groups and out-groups and simply having... Um, identifiers for that can be sufficient to uh, enable, uh, can, it can draw from disinformation and it can enable disinformation and disinformation going forward. But let's talk about splitting people up because that is awesome. Well, I, can I add on to something about that? A quick story. No, uh, in the, no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm shutting you down. <laughs> no. Go in the it. early 90s, I, uh, a friend of mine and I uh, drove to work together, had, had lunch, and this was over a summer, we were kind of working outside, and during the, during the uh, while we were eating lunch, we listened to Rush Limbaugh. I went the whole summer listening to Rush Limbaugh, laughing the whole time. At the end of the summer, mm -hmm. I, I was, you know, talking to him, I was like, eh, it sucks, I'm not going to listen to this because you have it on, but I'm not going to listen to this. And I go, and that's straight comedy. I, I, that's cool that they do this mm -hmm. skit on AM radio. And he goes, it's <laughs> not a skit. This is, a, and right then I was like, wait, this person really believes all this stuff. And he's like, yes. It, and it gets back to kind of uh, the old thing about like uh, um, Howard Stern. Why do you listen to him? Because he, cause I want to hear what he says. Why do the people who hate him listen to him? Because they want to hear what he says. And what it really hit to me is, there was a long time ago, there was a, a possibility that someone that could have seen what was happening stopped it early, but we didn't. We just let everything go, and it just kept creeping up and creeping up until now. Combating it is very hard, uh, and we have to be mm -hmm. on the lookout for the next Rush Limbaugh, left or right. We, we cannot mm -hmm. allow things like that. Uh, it's A, yeah. uh, there's... Um, Dragos said just in the chat, there's a lot of left-wing media outlets. Yeah, I mean, there's disinformation there too. They're just kind of harder Absolutely. to get thick. Uh, but, um, and the other thing is, it's not just that show. I mean, part of this is Sinclair buying up a lot of outlets. Uh, you, you know, I spent last mm -hmm. year driving all the way across America, listening to, to mm -hmm. radio stations and just hearing the same anti-left-wing stuff all over the country. It was really, really hard to find. A, I mean, I found one farm radio, one farm radio station in almost every state. I, I missed North Dakota. Sorry, North Dakota, but I did try to sample everywhere. So there, yeah. there's a sense that there just isn't the variety available in a lot of places. People are getting these yeah. single channels. It, it's similar with the um, the death of local news and the growth of national news. You know, um, people like with, with the death of the local newspaper. Um, basically, all the information that's left is the stuff that comes from um, you know, like Washington, New York, L.A. You know, these these or Chicago, like these major cities that can actually support uh, a a local newsroom that happens to be big enough to also be national. And as a result, you know, there, there isn't the local coverage that you know, uh, is actually necessary for a functioning society. Like if you don't know what's going on locally, um, you don't really know what's actually going on in the places that affect you. Yeah, so and that's the, actually one of the, the interesting of deserts. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, no, go, but, go ahead. Um, so I, 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 there was some interesting work on pink slime sites. So um, it was local labs. Um, so there were a set of 
right wing biased um, local in quotes um, news sites set up all over the country, all over the US. Actually, they set up news sites, they set up sites per state, um, they set up sites for specific topics, including health. Uh, they set up some sites mm -hmm. in different countries as well. But they, they were basically fake sites. They, they were, they looked, if you didn't know, like a local site. And they just looked like a little local um, paper, but it was all syndicated, um, generated text, mm -hmm. um, linked across to all of the other sites they owned. Plus, uh, every so often there was a, a human putting in stuff which was either borderline mm -hmm. or had some disinformation in it. And it, it was basically the astroturfing on this massive scale. And, and when I talk about going into information vacuums, that's, that's one of the things that was done, will be done. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. it's a... Uh, uh, that's, it's an issue. that's interesting because um, the other thing is during uh, 2016, during the, the U.S. campaign, um, you know, the, the fake news that um, ended up becoming a, a catchword was primarily these sort of uh, little WordPress sites that got set up as, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, you know, like the, Dan the Dallas Underground Chronicle or like yeah. the Denver Mile High you know, gazette, and you know, like they, they, yeah, like they were all these small, like they, they appeared to be small local news sites, and um, you know they weren't because there was actually no newspaper there, but the visual trappings to make it look like a news site are, you know, trivial to create, and once that's done, it's, it was easy to impersonate. Uh, local news because yeah like local news carries things that isn't on the national news we know that so it is possible to believe that some local story hasn't been picked up elsewhere you know, so it, it it helped the credibility there in appearing to be from a local news site um, so yeah like that like local news is very interesting um, and mm -hmm. Uh, but we've and we've talked about this before. I, I mean, you can't, or I would say, a, a great disinformation campaign has to bring in that local uh, field. Uh, yes, you can. Uh, yes, people will listen a little bit to stars and the president, whatever. But mm -hmm. the biggest impact is making it appear that it is your neighbor, your postman, your preacher, your whatever that is on board with this story or is relaying the story to you. It, it's so important to get that, that intimate connection to make this stuff work. Uh, we're yes, starting to absolutely. see flyers again now. So we're starting to see physical flyers being put out, which is yeah. interesting. It's, I haven't seen that for a bit. <laughs> well, I, I guess that's good for um, the local print communities, <laughs> businesses and, and kids who need jobs. I hope they're wearing masks when they go out and staying six feet away from each other <laughs> and they're distributing. <laughs> yeah. um, damn, where were we? Something about uh, uh, local news. Oh, no, no, no. We were going to talk about splitting up groups because this is, this is yeah. the cool stuff. Um, yeah, so uh, like basically, because I've done a huge amount of research on this, like one of one of the important things about humans is that we have um, tribal identities or clans. Like we we like to be part of groups. That's primarily how we identify. Um, but people also have uh, multiple identities. So you might um, you might be like, I'm a male. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a Cubs fan. I'm a Chicagoan. I'm, you know, uh, X U uh, Chicago. You know, there's there's a lot of different things that can be tribal identities. But depending on where you are, you'll have a different salient identity. You'll have a, a different identity that sort of comes up and dominates. So you know, when you're at home, probably your you know 
being a graduate of Chicago University is not your primary identity. Whereas if you go to your reunion, it would be. And if you're, you know, watching a football, whatever, baseball, what, what do Cubs do? If you're watching a sports baseball. ball, yeah, <laughs> if you're watching sports ball, then your, your Cubs fan identity might become your salient identity. And here, the thing that I want to get across is that because people have a huge number of these identities, uh, an effective campaign can pick and isolate an identity that creates a tribal group that people have, and it can amplify that and create a, a salient identity, an important tribal identity out of that. And then essentially the, the most important thing to understand about tribal identities is not so much, um, you know, we are Cubs fans. It's mostly that we are not fans of those other guys. And um, a, a huge amount of what defines tribal is the us versus them. So you, you end up with this great ability to, to fracture social groups if you can find at least two tribal groups within that larger social groups, larger social group and reinforce one identity. So we had a really interesting thing back in 2016. Um, so I was tracking with the Canadian um, disinformation. So we were pretty early on looking at uh, disinformation coming through. And we watched um, what we think was the Russians repurpose uh, American identity campaigns and put them straight into Canada as <laughs> right-wing identity campaigns, but without actually bothering to change all of the American identity markers. <laughs> so it, was, it was hilarious. It's like eagles and you know, God and country and all the rest of it. <laughs> but it seemed to work. I mean, they adapted after a while, but it was just like, how the hell did this work? <laughs> Somehow it did. Somehow the messaging was like more stronger than the hilariousness of the hell, wrong country, dudes. <laughs> Uh, hey, uh, enough repetition and it it beats a person down yeah and the other thing is if um a, a lot of messaging depends on how receptive people are so if, if you're you know if you're neo-nazi curious then you know a, a neo-nazi message even if it's you know spelled with english spelling instead of american spelling will resonate with you more than if you know um you're somewhat skeptical of, you know, the neo-Nazi messaging in general, then you'll notice things like, not only is this a completely garbage idea, they don't even spell right. I try so, so hard not to feel that real curious. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, uh, one, let me ask Matt something real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt, we're on till 1.15. Because I have seen a few questions and, and I want to make sure that we some oh. okay oh. gotcha okay gotcha. okay well as i was gonna say if there's questions then uh matt if you can like read them out yeah, yeah no um, worries i actually had a, a, a question before uh mm -hmm. you, you say you collected a bunch of narratives and you're focusing on narratives mainly because there's too much information out there uh, re regarding the, the pandemic now, uh, around how many narratives uh, have you been uh, identif uh, have you identified? Oh God, I mean there are dozens of narratives at the moment going on around COVID. Uh, let me look at one list. So the list coming out of uh, the Carnegie Foundation has 163 narratives give you an idea of that. Um, coming out of uh, EU versus Disinfo. Maybe, uh, they've maybe got, give some example narratives as well. Oh, um, I mean, is, yeah. the, is the so, WHO one of the narrative? Or is it not uh, WHO has the narrative list as well. So yeah. the narrative yeah. is a dozen or more. Yeah. Um, so they, they, so like, some, some narratives are like, um, that the coronavirus is a bioweapon. 
Yeah. And then variations are it's a Chinese bioweapon, it's a CIA bioweapon, uh, it's a Russian bioweapon. It's um, an American bioweapon. I, I, I like the Bill Gates bio uh, theory yeah. that he started. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> he's, it's just to promote the seven factories that he's throwing up to work on. Uh, <laughs> Interesting. But this is where we talk about campaigns with incidents underneath, because some of these are just up and down very quickly. <laughs> So, for instance, uh, the one about Stafford Act being being uh, implemented, that happened about three weeks ago, and it just like turned up, disappeared. Um, everyone went on under stay at home, and it just wasn't useful anymore. Although we have seen flyers um, yesterday about those, so someone's trying to revive it a little, uh, just reuse, um, and some are, are going to last longer. So you know, all the ones about lockdown. They're, they're, they're done and gone. That that's happened. So it's, it's playing on people's fears at the time. So um, someone in yeah, the yeah, chat is animal. mentioning five uh, G or so. Like two people actually mentioned oh. like the five G narrative uh, because that one I didn't see. No. Uh, is it like a new one or is it something that started with Huawei, for instance? Oh, five G has been going on forever. Yeah. I mean, the UK yeah. at the moment has managed to wrap five G with coronavirus with anti-China. So there's a whole bunch of interesting narratives going on there <laughs> around yeah. China is bad, therefore 5G is part of China, therefore 5G is bad, therefore let's burn some towers. Um, yeah, and that's but, that's part of tribal identity as well, because it's got yeah. a, you know, we're scared. Um, what's a good us versus them? And what's something we can do that's also kind of fun? And burning stuff is kind of fun. And, you know, we are not China. So that's, that's and, you know, Again, the UK happens to be pretty good on identity politics, taking Brexit, for example, you know, and the cricket test and all these other, uh, like, <laughs> if there's ever been a country that knows how to create tribal groups. <laughs> Sorry. It's the English. <laughs> we did some very bad things. Uh, yeah. See, so uh, ask about mm. how we trace back the origin of the narrative. So I guess, I guess that's mm -hmm. probably worth talking about as well. So, yes, yeah, I mean, you, you, all you have generally, I mean, you have the top end and the bottom end. Um, so we have something called the pyramid, which is uh, at the top, we have those campaigns and then we have the incidents within the campaign. And then those incidents sit on narratives, the narratives sit on the, the artifacts, the, the messages, the users. So, and the images, whatever other things we actually see online. So we'll, we'll see them. Um, we'll see things starting to bubble up. Um, you're, there are a whole bunch of really useful sites for, for, for looking for those things bubbling up. And as you see phrases, um, words starting to come through, you start tracking back those phrases, words. You, you look at um, uh, botnets that are known, look at what they're talking about. You, you look at connected actors, the ones that are starting to talk, and you track back in time. You, you track back across platforms. Um, you can't do exact phrase matching as much anymore um, because those damn smart machine learning people get in the way. Uh, so you can do things like uh, we were doing some latent Duruche analysis over, over the weekend, looking at what the clusters of topics were, which isn't, you're not grouping by words, so you're now grouping by which things, which sets of messages are most connected to each other, and then looking at the words within those. Uh, and a lot of it is just really careful tracking. Um, you're, you're doing very, very similar things to OSINT. Uh, it, it's forensics. It's, it's a combination of applying some algorithms and doing some detailed forensics. Okay, back to you, G. Well, I was going to say, did, did you want to speak about Amit briefly? Like, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, for tools like and this, frameworks. This, yeah, I was going to say, like, because this isn't just like sort of hand wavy stuff. Um, SJ and Pablo, one of our colleagues who's not here, um, they they put in considerable time to build a framework and um, you're a life dude <laughs> <laughs> so um. yeah we, we spotted this lot ahead of time so um 
couple of years back, uh, I started talking. You'll have seen me at a couple of conferences, maybe. Um, hey, Dragos. Talking about the way that you can apply information security principles to misinformation, disinformation campaigns. And one of the things that we knew was needed was a way to share information rapidly about incidents as they emerge. So we started looking at frameworks, description frameworks. We looked for existing misinformation description frameworks, didn't find a lot. Uh, Department of Justice had something useful, but um, we looked at advertising frameworks. We looked at PSYOPs. Uh, we looked at all the military stuff that existed and we looked at infosec frameworks and we looked at cyclical ones. We looked at the stage based ones, the, the kill chains. And we came up with a kill chain for disinformation called Amit. Um, we deliberately made it look very similar to the attack framework. And it's so similar that now MITRE has taken it off our hands and going to be start, start managing it for us, which is yay, cool. Um, and we now have a 12 stage model. So when we see an incident emerge, we're looking from the strategic planning level so starts with strategic planning, objective planning, through to a whole bunch of preparation steps where you're developing the people you need, you're, you're, you're finding your useful idiots, you're developing those fake accounts, you're developing the networks you need to push information through, you're developing the content you need to put on it. You, you're working out which channels you're putting it through, you're doing some micro-targeting if you want adverts, and then you start putting it out. You, you start doing um, fast leaks through things like journalists, you're doing baiting, uh, you're putting out through botnets, uh, you're putting it out en masse, and you've got the physical stuff um, where you're pushing to the physical, the leaflets are one, um, things like t-shirts are another one, but there's also things like you can use disinformation to create physical effects, like um, we've seen two groups, two opposing groups being given meeting protest places, times, and places at the same place, same place and time to see if you could create a in, in life, in real person conflict. Uh, and then you're seeing if you can keep this running. Um, there's some M&E measure, um, effectiveness measures at the end, because you're going to, if you're running a long campaign, you want to make the next one better. So we're basically, that's the model we have of what the bad guys are doing. And we use that model to look at the ways to counter uh, underneath each of those, there's a set of techniques that we, we see are being used. So when we see an incident, we tag the techniques we've seen, uh, we tag the um, artifacts we see in there, we tag the actors in there. So we have um, Amit is now sitting in MISP. Um, we've, we've got it in sticks. Um, so we carry it on sticks for threat intelligence. We, we have it in MISP to, to share. So we're talking to a few countries about this um, who are trialing with us, um, us being the COGSAP collab. And it, it's how we make sense uh, and how we track what's going on. So, uh, yeah, because it was yeah. a year of our lives just getting the frameworks in place so that we could rapidly share because we saw this coming. We, we knew that it would reach a point where you couldn't just do this by hand. Okay, gee, back to you. I've done the sales pitch. <laughs> no, as 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 just saying, uh, I was thinking like the the two groups meeting up was actually the most successful physical event that those guys managed. But there's a lot of really fascinating stuff about that whole campaign. Like um, my my firm belief is that um, they. They, because they believed that the color revolutions were CIA events, they believed that the CIA had a capability to, you know, spontaneously create these huge protests, right? That, that somehow this was a thing that the CIA was able to do and they wanted to replicate it. Like they wanted to say, you know, we, we have the same capability that CIA has, we can create large protests and so they tried multiple times in multiple different ways to get 
um, you know, large groups of people to show up. And the closest it came was that, that one incident in Texas. And that didn't have the result that they were obviously looking for. Um, and I think that they, they failed to realize that the color protests were not organized by CIA, you know, a couple days in advance. You know, like they, they, they were not, um, they're not a CIA capability. And um, Americans are lazy as fuck, right? If, if you tell them to like, oh, and, and America is big. So if, if you want a whole bunch of people that agree with you um, to go somewhere, the odds of them all being within, you know, easy distance of each other is actually pretty low. You know, like you could probably find a thousand people who agree with you in the U.S., but they're going to be, you know, hundreds of miles from each other. Um, and they're not going to want to travel, you know, unless they're really, really dedicated, like uh, Star Trek fans or something. You know, they're not going to invest that much time and effort to show up somewhere. Um, my favorite anecdote, by the way, out of uh, 2016 is how uh, basically every, every physical event was tracked down to at least one local news story, except in uh, Florida. One of the things that the, the Russians had done was they had paid people by a fiver to uh, have a truck with a cage in the back and someone dressed as Hillary in an orange jumpsuit, right? Um, you know, like locked up in the back of this cage in a truck. And they couldn't figure out which of three trucks with cages and Hillary's in orange jumpsuits was the one that was organized by the Russians and which of the other two were organized by locals. And I, I think that that says a lot about just how much um, you know, othering has been done about the disinformation campaign and the misinformation campaigns that were happening, where a lot gets blamed on Russia. But if you look at this, you know, like they can't even tell which of these, you know, uh, anti Hillary locker up props was the Russian one and which of the other and which was indigenous. You know, there's a huge amount that was actually local and it's very, very hard to blame it on uh, an external group, even though it's much, um, it feels better to do that than to admit that, you know, um, that disinformation is coming from inside the house. So that was the comment I had on that because you reminded me of the, uh, the funny thing. Cool. Uh, I, I did. I have, I have a quick question, actually, uh, regarding the framework and the tools, you know, uh, because, you know, like there is, we talk a lot about the disinformation and misinformation, but also online, there's something I haven't seen like people covering much is uh, uh, more uh, regarding like radicalization and, uh, you know, like online extremism, uh, like how would that register under like disinformation and misinformation? Because even if you look at the data, I will take like Facebook and Twitter as an example, because so far they're only, the only one releasing like uh, like official like uh, reports. Um, if you see like Facebook is not releasing much details. Uh, tw Twitter is doing a bit of effort without uh, giving much uh, context, but for like radicalization is like Amit something that could be applied? And have you seen like people doing uh, work around it? Mm -hmm. We, we certainly looked at radicalization as part of the development of uh, AMIT, and we think you can. Um, we've included sales funnels. So it turns out the sales funnels are actually really useful for modeling radicalization. You, you have the same um, people become aware, people become part of, then become uh, transmitters of an idea. Whether that idea is this product is wonderful or this right wing idea is great. So um yeah i mean we we built it so it could be used for that and we're linking up with the group that's handling um some radicalization too so we'll we'll see we'll, we'll give, give give us a week see how we're doing <laughs> okay okay Thing, things are moving fast right now we, we were planning to spend this year building up the tool chain and 
we're now developing as we use. Yeah, a different roadmap. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, COVID. Yeah. <laughs> well, on the plus side, everyone's got more time at home, so, you know. Oh, yeah. We can focus on that. Um, well, all this time, if you have kids, you know, like... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't have kids and you're in a CTI league and you want to come play in this information, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, so I'm going to segue very badly because we were talking about physical things. I want to bring up the, um, the sort of uh, the power plays like this, the geopolitical uh, soft power moves that are going on now with COVID because they're very interesting and I'm, I'm not seeing analysis on them in the media. It's just more of a, a flat reporting of what's going on. So here I'm talking about things like um, Russia sending military trucks into Italy to um, you know, help disinfect um, uh, China donating uh, PPE and medical equipment um to you know uh like uh, they, they the well initially it was italy but like i think the biggest one was when um cuomo came out and literally said you know like thank you to jack ma and you know uh consul wong and so on for helping us get um masks and ppe and these things where uh you know russia and china are using aid to appear um benevolent and i mean you know yes they are in at least one way being benevolent but um you know it's it's not pure altruism it's this sort of soft power play is the sort of thing that you would expect from the us right like when the Ebola crisis happened. Um, there wasn't, you know, Russia sending military trucks to disinfect African villages and China sending plane loads of supplies. It was the US that did that. And now the US is literally having um, China send supplies directly to, you know, the, the states, like individual states. and. To me, it's absolutely amazing that these countries are able to exercise soft power inside the U.S. Does anyone have any comments? Hmm. <laughs> uh, exactly. Uh, if there there is a vacuum now, and somebody is going to fill it. I, I mean, we're looking at a world. I mean, but what I do in my the rest of my time is things like map. Um, what happens if all the borders close and everyone stops sending food to each other? You know, who's suddenly going to be starving? And we're about to hit a world where COVID-19 is going to hit some countries a lot worse than others. Um, if you think about it, you know, 50% 50, 50 or 20% means the 10% population being, being a not to put a finer point on it, the projections for Haiti are 800,000 dead out of 11 million. And repeat that around the world. And you've got yourself mm -hmm. a Cold War style race between countries to gain ground and support. Uh, and that's already happening, but it's, it's happening in places we would never have dreamed. No, Italy, Italy for gods. <laughs> you know, NATO country, Europe, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> okay, like, let, let's be fair. So, First World War, Italy was with the British, right? Second World War, they were with the Germans. So, Third World War, it's fair enough that they should be with the Russians this time. <laughs> well, don't. don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we had them the other two World Wars. <laughs> We've done our bit. Someone else is stuck with them now. <laughs> well, in and the, the other day, I, I, you know, yes, like Haiti will be bad. We talk about these countries are going to be hit. Uh, I keep waiting for the ball to drop in India. And yeah. India's looked very much inside so far. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot, mm -hmm. lot of displaced people. I mean, a lot of, 
well, a, a, that didn't make it. Yeah, a, a large population on top of each other, bad health care, and then but that it, if that happens, talk about being able to shift world power. I, I mean, Russia or China being right there and being able to not now not just you know uh, really influence uh, places with their soft power. Um, sort of, it can be scary. Not just soft power. Um, I mean, at some point we'll probably end up in proxy yeah. wars. Well, yeah. yeah, and one one of the the scary things about the um, the dynamic between India and China is that the Indians do like basically their their entire um, espionage effort has been focused on Pakistan and things like that, and not on China. So they do not actually know what Chinese thinking is. They they don't have insights uh, from human sources that say, okay, yes, they're doing the saber rattling, but really, you know, it's just for the internal market, you can ignore it. Right. They, they don't have those sources, so they don't have that insight. So they're kind of flying blind. They're in the same bucket as, you know, uh, the rest of the public. So um, that that has a very, very bad potential to go very badly wrong simply because they lack visibility. Um, I'm not sure the other way around. I think China probably has quite good visibility on India. Um, at least, you know, like they've definitely hacked the shit out of them. <laughs> well, I've been pretty impressed by their intelligence gathering, yeah. But oh yeah. They, oh, some of this uh, is, it, you know, some countries play the long game much, much longer than others. Mm. <laughs> Uh, uh, but but some really, some countries yeah. are really good on the, the 24 hour cycle, you know, <laughs> like the US, they're, they're excellent on that uh, immediate 24 hour, can't see past, you know. Um, well, you know, the Brits have a saying but, a week is a long time in politics, you know, it's, <laughs> depends on your scales, depends on your plans, depends on what you actually want to do geopolitically. And also on you mm -hmm. know, whether geopolitics is going to be the same. No, it's been territory yeah. based. Now is it moving to, to human based, to be personhood based? Mm. Right. Yeah. Mm. Well, you've got um, geopolitics, uh, you've got power, you've got money, the, the usual motivations. So um, yeah, not sure. I think it depends yeah. on where you yeah. look. You know, um, like it, it varies by country, and uh, it also varies by topic. So it depends, and you know, it varies by time. So when elections come up, obviously political disinformation campaigns ramp up a lot more than sort of in a lull when there's opportunities for, for other things. Um, but entrepreneurs are going to sit on back of it. Um, so they're going to make yeah. money either running campaigns for other people or running their own sites. Anti-vax, I mean, they make a lot of money. Oh. So, you know, you've got advertising, you've got merchandise, you've got, yeah. yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, there's a suspicion that Trump has a financial interest, um, which is why he keeps pushing it. Uh, like that does appear to be true uh, in a literal sense, but um, I, I, I support the theory that someone else put out that he's literally just looking for a miracle cure to make this be over. Like he, it's not so much that he expects to make money out of it. Um, he just wants something to make this go away because he's got nothing else um, that he can figure out what to do. So I, I think that there's that. The 
other thing is that um, it, it's, it came from, again, an information vacuum where basically in China, they were trying literally everything. And, you know, these weren't randomized trials. These were people who were desperate and they'd say, okay, well, we gave a whole bunch of different drugs to a bunch of different people and some of them survived. Here are the things that we gave to people and people sort of latched onto different ones. I mean, uh, here in Thailand, for a while, they were saying that um, these uh, like uh, HIV cocktail drugs were effective. And it just, it wasn't necessarily that HIV cocktail drugs are effective. It's just, they were throwing, you know, spaghetti at the wall. This was something that they tried and the person recovered. So, you know, that's one data point. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure it's driven by finances so much as it is by fear. Like people are just desperate for something that will make this go away quickly. Um, that's my suspicion. And uh, I, I do want to point out, I, I think it was either this morning or, or yesterday that as much as he's pushing that, uh, a doctor, uh, I believe it is at the Mayo Clinic, sorry if I don't remember exactly correctly, was like, hey, but don't forget there are side effects to this drug. We need to be talking about that just as much. And it is amazing how it seemed like that story went and then just got shut down. So I think we're on to our last points, aren't we, um, Matt? Yep. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah, which so, mentioned uh, um, the point of across uh, the uh, the kill chain. Oh yeah, I mean basically that it, it's not just about taking down the bots. Um, we have the kill chain, and we're building out counters across the whole of the kill chain. It, it, it's a lot more that we can actually do about disinformation campaigns than you think. And uh, re regarding that yeah. point, you know, because uh, and I guess also one of the problem with that, the reason people think it's just like bots and uh, Facebook and Twitter is also because they, they are the only one publishing some like uh, reports. I mean, if we can call them reports, even like Twitter recently for this month and last month, they just posted some tweets. They are not even writing blog posts anymore, uh, which is uh, a bit surprising. Uh, do you think like even like those companies are like even prepared internally because it seems like there is also some blind spots if it's non-English content also like it seems like there is a huge focus on English content and it sounds like even their team uh, well I'm gonna take like Twitter and Facebook as example uh, again for like uh, uh, companies because they're the only one trying to do stuff but even uh, with them it sounds like their team are very small and they don't even have the uh, I don't know, like people speaking like more language than uh, than uh, than English. Uh, I remember like uh, Greg, like a few years back we, when we talked about uh, Myanmar, it was a big uh, problem uh, mm -hmm. for for Facebook. And I think when, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, one of the main problem is that uh, if it was not in English, uh, a bit like the 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 the, the French uh, police when there is terrorist attack, if it's not uh, written in French, uh, like people get lost. Like, do you see any like uh, any like strategy like from a social media company or even like news company about like being able to analyze uh, non-English content? Because obviously, data and aggregation is very important mm -hmm. because that allows us to make uh, like some proper like uh, like uh, t you know uh, percentage on different uh, things and statistics. But what about non-English content uh, for for that point? It's not just non-English, so, it's also you have mm -hmm. to localize. Um, so yeah. I was working at GDI last year mm -hmm. and I was looking at disinformation in Kenya. I, I used to be a data director for a Kenyan company. So I had some idea of the data landscape there. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have people who live there, they can't tell you what the disinformation is. They can't yeah. tell you what is normal information there. Yeah. So it, it becomes a lot harder if you don't have local people. Yeah. I mean, WhatsApp, I guess, is a good example because a lot of like local news get shared on, on WhatsApp. And uh, the, the best that uh, Facebook was able to do is to limit like the number of time you can forward the message. And they're doing that only because of the pandemic. And it took them, uh, I don't know, many years because we know that they, was a they, problem. They've done that in elections they, in the South American countries yeah. before. It, it's not and, the first uh, time. They, they also do that. Sorry. Yeah. And they, they also did that in India. Um, so it's country when, specific. When were, 
Um, yeah, like the the Indian one they did because there were like race riots and people were getting killed. So, um, like that became important because they didn't want to be held liable for people dying, which incidentally is going to happen to Fox News because of all the disinformation they put out about COVID. There's been at least one person who has died who believed that the virus was a hoax. So uh, Fox is lawyering up and they're kind of scared of being sued for causing people to die because they were lying, which I think is kind of interesting. But um, in terms of language, I can say that basically the, the only thing I've seen aside from English is uh, a lot of these places hired Russian speakers because they figured that having uh, Russian speakers would be good for understanding what was happening with, you know, IRA um, and uh, Russian based disinformation campaigns. And then they found out that it's not really that useful. I mean, like it's, it's great, but you know, that's not where most of the disinformation comes from. So I've seen that there are now a fair, a fair number of these people looking at disinformation campaigns in um, that are, you know, in the Russian language. But, you know, to be fair, literally everywhere that um, speaks Russian as at least a second language, they're pretty comfortable handling disinformation. Now, they, they, they have a fairly long history of dealing with disinformation. <laughs> You know, they're, they're not looking for Americans to tell them that there's a bunch of Twitter bots promoting something. You know, these people live through Pravda. They're good. <laughs> yeah. Also, like, uh, I don't think we've seen much uh, online report about uh, India disinformation campaigns, like uh, like Twitter data set that are like country specific that they never release once about India. Uh, if you want yeah. India, you're the greatest person to track. Sorry? If you want India disinformation, Rung Rage is a good person to track. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, no, there is a bunch of them uh, mm. like uh, that are active. I'm just surprised and so that social media companies are not uh, doing anything for that, you know? Uh, so I, I actually yeah. want to stop us there for a second because I want to pull us back on topic that it isn't Facebook, it isn't Twitter. That's the important stuff. I, I, yeah, I yeah, of course. will always go back that it is the local things that are most important. Uh, and I saw somebody post in there, uh, critical thinking for the win. Critical thinking is important, but guess what? A good psyoper, which I, I used to be psyop, so I still call it psyop, can take your intelligence and use it against you. You can be brilliant and I can still trick you. So don't, mm -hmm. and part of it is that overconfidence that I'm too smart to, to fall for something, right? So emotion controls everything. And at the local level, that's where you get really emotional. Yes, at the at the top mm -hmm. level you do, but when you're with your people, when you're with your tribe, that's when you're really emotional and you allow your your intelligence to be subverted a bit. Yeah, um, a, an excellent example of that is that um, there is a Russian-based disinformation uh, group that puts out these propaganda videos on. Twitter and and I hate to I hate to go back to social media when we're talking about this is not social media, but these propaganda videos are targeted at groups and tribes, and um, okay, like there's now this which is not the Russian one, and they've created a sort of a visual format. You know, there's a very stark white, black, yellow. That's their visual thing. And then there's like, um, I think the Russian one is like, this is now. It's very, very similar. It's designed to confuse people looking at it. They even use the same visual cues, but they put out- I think they use the same videos. music. Yeah, like it, it looks very, very similar. Anyway, um, some of those videos have ripped through the InfoSec Twitter community you know, and we consider ourselves fairly smart, but when something shows up 
and you watch it and it just emotionally grabs you with basically a point of view that you agree with, right? Like um, the one I was thinking of was a police brutality thing and it's, it got huge traction and afterwards I went through and I analyzed it and I was like, oh my God, this, like, this is so flimsy and terrible. I can't imagine that anyone ever fell for it, but all of us did. So uh, that's the thing is it's, it's not about being smart. Um, all of this stuff is emotional and I'm getting told I have to shut up. <laughs> and then, I mean, no, but uh, we're going to have to wrap up, uh, I guess, soon. Like if there is any like conclusion points or anything like you, 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 want, you want to close on. Uh, no, no, I guess now is the time. I don't see more questions from the chat either. Uh, um, just the, yeah, just the same stuff we started out with. It's that like uh, social media is a, a distribution channel. It's not the end all and be all of disinformation. Um, all of this anti-disinformation stuff that's, that's going on, um, a lot of it that's just focused on taking down bots and things like that, it's, it's missing the important stuff. And you can learn more about the important stuff by looking at Dammit. And uh, I believe we're putting out a counters document mm -hmm. at some point. Um, yeah. And you'll see that it's, you know, like there's a lot of stages in that kill chain that are much more effective and um, it would be good to go after those, not the, the final end target, just the, the messaging bit. So, um, yeah, wrapping up, that's it, you know, like disinformation is everywhere and, and it's not limited too. to social media. <laughs> Cool. Well, uh, uh, thanks to uh, all of you and thanks for your time. Uh, we're getting some positive feedback in, uh, in the chat. Uh, so I'm sure it was uh, really uh, informative for a lot of people. Uh, it's going to be recorded, so that, that's good. Uh, any other point you want to uh, close on, uh, Brian, Sarah? No, good. No. I'm good. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, thanks, Matt. Thanks uh, for joining us today. And uh, yeah, thanks for having us, Matt. Yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries. Okay. And uh, we are back uh, for uh, more presentations. So thanks for staying with us. Uh, if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to ask them in the chat. I can always relay them. Um, some uh, good points uh, by Dragos, actually. Uh, we mentioned uh, something about the uh, IRC channel. Uh, so there is an IRC channel. Uh, as you can see, Dragos, I, I made a slide, a slide actually for it. Um, you're more than welcome to join it. If you want to participate to the discussion on the YouTube chat, you're more than welcome to ask questions there. But also, you can also ask your questions on Twitter and uh, use the hashtag upcut 2020 or you can just be like uh, Juan you know who is gonna you know posting uh, post a bunch of tweets and uh, abuse of the hashtag a bit you know but uh, we, we like him so we won't uh, <laughs> we won't say anything he was just excited to see uh, Ryan speaking and uh, yeah uh, so we had the keynote we had the discussion panel about uh, this information and now we're gonna uh, switch to a more like technical part of the uh, conference we're going to be speaking uh, about uh, how you can uh, tap your own uh, internet and then uh, Zoom security. So, uh, Kostin, you can uh, get ready and I'm going to launch uh, the uh, intermission uh, while you can uh, start uh, sharing your screen. Thank you. Yes, Social well. distancing, you say. The future is watching. Welcome to Opcode Virtual Summit. Check, check if you can hear me well. Uh, yeah, let me, I'm just looking for your window here. So one sec. Can you uh, share? No, I'm Can sharing you share now. Your screen? Yeah. I am now. Uh, yeah, uh, perfect. So I guess. Uh... Okay, bye, Greg. And. Uh... And bye, Sarah. Bye, Brian. Thank you. Let me just relaunch this.
Okay, that's it. You can uh, go ahead, uh, Kostin. Uh, the scene is ready for you. Thank you, Matt, and um, thanks everybody for staying uh, through this very interesting discussion. Uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, this information, and uh, now we're going to talk a bit about uh, the opposite, which is information. In particular, uh, we're going to talk a bit about uh, you know how to know more about the things which are happening in your network at home, and actually. Um, the idea for this talk, um, it came to me in uh, 2016 in January when uh, Rob Joyce, who used to be the head of the uh, Tailored Access Operations Group at uh, the NSA, uh, I think that he uh, moved on seems to other positions, but he made a speech at the uh, Usenix uh, Enigma conference. And he said um, something very interesting that a lot of people um, already knew, but I guess that this was a quite interesting confirmation of uh, what we knew. And he said, I quote, one of our worst nightmares is that out of band network tab that is really capturing all the data, understanding anomalous behavior that's going on and someone paying attention to it. So you got to know your network, understand your network because we are going to. Now, this was rather interesting uh, from several points of view. In particular, for me, it was interesting because um, about, uh, I guess, maybe four or five months uh, uh, before his talk, actually, I started tapping my home internet very much in the same way through an out-of-band network tap. And, well, what does it mean? Uh, well, in terms of network OPSEC, Speaking from 2020, work from home, everybody is pretty much, uh, I guess, stuck at home unless you guys are living in Sweden or Belarus or other countries which have, uh, may, let's say, non-orthodox policy where it comes to social isolation. So as we're spending more and more time at home, um, maybe I would say it's interesting for you and for everybody to spend some time as well looking at your network traffic. And there's actually quite, let's say, a few good reasons for that. Now, uh, speaking about the basics um, and uh, let's say thread modeling, let's say, let's think a bit about uh, who are, let's say, the actors that you need to worry about. Well, the low profile actors are generally not a threat. So they will not be able to fish you or steal your credentials or maybe exploit you with a two, three, five years old uh, exploit because I guess everybody is by now patched. Um, on the other hand, pretty much all high profile actors, if they want, they can very easily infect you. And it's just a matter of cost justification. So if they can justify, let's say, spending half a million dollars or one or two million dollars uh, on zero days and using those zero days uh, on you, then you, I, I would say there's pretty much uh, very little that you can do to stop them. So our assumption and objectives here would be that uh, we are or will be infected, that this is just a fact and we can't stop it. Um, because again, it's just a matter of cost justification. And when this happens, what we actually want, we want to catch it. Now, remember that the infection is a matter of cost. And what we wanna do, we'll try to increase the cost of as much as possible. And the other thing to keep in mind is that routine is the opposite of security. So actually we want to keep changing our OPSEC always adapting to the latest trends. And this is uh, one of the things that I am doing myself, in case you're wondering. So today I'm just gonna speak about point number one. And uh, well, if I don't mess up things badly, maybe Matt will invite me in the future to speak about the other two points. But nevertheless, today we want to speak just about point number one, which is how to monitor your home internet for APTs. Now, the reality is that the harder requirements for this task are, let's say, not that uh, complicated. So what we need, obviously, is an Ethernet internet. It will be difficult, way more difficult to monitor fiber optic internet. But Ethernet internet can be quite easily monitored. And we'll need a hub 
or a smart switch. And we'll need a mini, mini PC for this purpose as well. Now, for the Ethernet hub, uh, you can still find them uh, on eBay. Well, the sad part here is that uh, you can't purchase them new anymore. I don't think that you can find this anymore. Uh, still, you can find them on eBay for $10, $15. Uh, and keep in mind that a hub is not the same as a switch. A hub will just mirror the traffic through all the ports and uh, we're gonna take advantage of that to monitor the internet traffic. Now, of course, I know what some of you will say. Uh, you'll say that uh, we have gigabit at home and don't worry, I've got you covered. Instead of a hub, you can actually use a smart switch. Tick switch for about uh, $40. Uh, this is a gigabit switch with management. Uh, it is available pretty much everywhere. And there's also another option here, a Netgear switch, uh, which uh, pretty much can accomplish the same thing. So you want the smart managed versions of these routers, which have the ability to do port mirroring. So we're gonna use port mirroring to replicate the internet traffic. Now for the mini PC, um, you can either use something like an Intel Nuke, maybe you can convince Ryan Narain to send you a free Nuke, um, I haven't, and or you can use a maybe Raspberry Pi uh, version four, which are quite powerful and quite cheap in my opinion. Um, optional, you can also use an USB network card. And why do you need that? Well, we may want to do both tap and access into the mini PC. So uh, this way, of course, uh, you can connect the mini PC to your internal network, but then it will not be out of band anymore. Me personally, I, I have, uh, let's say, very good experience using both uh, Edimax and Anchor adapters, which are like $10, $15. So the whole setup, uh, I would say, costs between $150 and maybe $400. So this is what we have. Uh, the internet goes into the hub. The hub replicates one port into your Wi-Fi router. Another port goes into your mini PC. And then, again, you can, uh, if you want, uh, you'll reduce the security a bit by doing it so, but it's maybe more convenient. Again, it will not be out of band anymore, but you can connect an USB Ethernet adapter to the mini PC back into the router, and then you can just log in, in there to see what's going on. Now, for the mini PC, I run uh, Linux and uh, Suricata version 3 plus because we want uh, the DNS log from Suricata. You want to enable DNS log, HTTP log, and the fast log with extended formats. Uh, you want to enable TLS log. And I personally disable stat log, which just uh, you know, fills the disk. Uh, for NetFlow, you can use PMACCTD. Um, and if you're really paranoid and have a lot of disk space, I guess you can uh, also just TCP dump. Um, pretty much everything. So one idea could be, for instance, not port 443, because dumping port 443 might not be uh, very productive or useful. Uh, one of the issues here is that, for instance, uh, streaming platforms like Netflix or I don't know, HBO Go, they use port 80 for that. So you're gonna, if you're gonna watch, let's say some um, 4K movies, uh, you will fill your hard drive very quickly. Um, what do the logs look like? These are the kind of logs that um, Suricata produces. Uh, what you see here is a DNS log. You see a couple of queries. You see a couple of um, responses. Um, I personally, I process these DNS logs into a much, uh, let's say, easier to work uh, with format in which we have a timestamp, we have the host, and we have the respective IP resolution um, for that. And this, um, I well process in many different ways by, and you can obviously do the same. Um, for instance, maybe one of the easiest things to do um, is shown here by this bash script. You can just uh, take the logs, um, you can extract the DNS queries from uh, uh, the last couple of days or the yeah, last day, and then you can just make uh, a top of the DNS queries and uh, email them to you just to get an idea of how many queries are happening per day from your home. And there's of course many other 
uh, ideas. Um, there's also, let's say, an improvement. The first improvement to this uh, method would be uh, to have the network tap and then to have some IOCs that you can also check on the network traffic. And for instance, you can take a bunch of IOCs and can try to match them against the network traffic. Uh, my recommendation would be to match them both on the actual traffic and going back a couple of months uh, just in case, because sometimes you get IOCs and uh, those IOCs are related to something which happened uh, in the past. Um, and together, this can also prove uh, quite useful. Now, there's even more improvements uh, that you can do. Some of the things that I am doing myself um, uh, in terms of heuristics, for instance, would be a TLS certificates, uh, TLS connections, SSL certificates analysis. Uh, for instance, looking for connections um, associated with hosts which have self-signed certificates. Uh, and this can be a very good uh, giveaway of traffic that shouldn't be there. Um, DNS queries frequency is another thing you can do. For instance, uh, look for some kind of a pattern. You can apply for real transforms and find the DNS queries which happen regularly, such as maybe every hour or maybe every six hours, uh, well, and so on and so on. Another thing to search for would be unusual domains, uh, things like, uh, you know, .pw or .cf or .tk. And there's a lot of these free um, uh, domains out there, uh, pretty much similar to dynamic DNS uh, providers, which are also quite interesting to spot in the traffic. So all these uh, are likely to boost your detection capabilities. And then uh, other ideas could be, um, for instance, uh, net flow analysis, extracting the top traffic IPs, uh, doing a who is look up on them and just uh, flagging them for inspection. Uh, I do this regularly and uh, I filter out things like uh, the Netflix IPs, um, like uh, all the other streaming uh, IPs. Uh, and what is left, obviously, whenever you see a spike in there, that requires some additional inspection. Now, all of this, I know it sounds quite nice, uh, uh, but yeah, what, what can you find with this? And you guys are gonna say, um, you know, uh, show us uh, the money, show us what you found with it. So yeah, let me show you what I call case number one that was spotted by this technology. Um, I was like one day, you see that actually it was uh, quite a long time ago, um, 2014. Uh, I was looking at my DNS logs and I spotted a suspicious looking um, host name, sachex.info or sachex.info. And if you look at the timestamps, um, you will probably notice that this is kind of happening regularly, almost like um, every hour. So what we have here, like uh, 11 p.m., midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and so on. So this is pretty much uh, what I was talking about. This is the case of something which is being queried once per hour, like regularly with maybe some jitter correction. So it's not always on the same minute. So I started uh, looking into this just to understand the first thing. Uh, if I looked into the who is record of these hosts uh, and I noticed there are some Gmail like pretty generic Gmail addresses associated with this, 310 Crescent at Gmail, Robert Statica at Gmail. Uh, couldn't find, let's say, anything interesting on it. Uh, so I did a bit more digging. I tried to connect there on HTTPS. Uh, there's a blank page, nothing to see. Um, doing a bit more digging. If you look into the certificate, uh, the certificate uh, is also pretty generic. Uh, there's no organization uh, in there. Well, it's issued by uh, GoDaddy. It was valid for one year. So at this point, you can imagine that I uh, became quite suspicious. And I, I, let's say I was quite confident that I caught something that shouldn't be in there. This shouldn't be in my network traffic. Um, also, by just Googling for setchecks.info, uh, you 
back then you wouldn't find much. So there was like pretty much nothing uh, in there. So I decided just to block it uh, because I control my own DNS server. Maybe we can talk about this uh, uh, another time, how to set up your own uh, blocking DNS using PyHole and various blocking lists. But I just blocked it for um, my uh, home network. And then, you know, uh, I kind of uh, suspiciously discovered that uh, also the amount of queries that I was getting, they were more or less matching what appeared to be some kind of a pattern. So if you look into this graphic, uh, which is by hours, you notice that the amount of connections is lower between maybe 12 and 6, 7 p.m. And to be honest, I, I was wondering why that is the case. So keep looking. I, uh, it's actually making these queries. Um, funny thing is uh, that when I started counting the amount of devices in my home network, um, I've reached a funny number of about 34 different devices connected uh, to the internet. So that includes like uh, a bunch of uh, smart TVs, tablets, uh, mobile phones, uh, network attached storages, uh, smart watches, and so on and so on. 34 different devices were connected. But uh, well, what was going on here, obviously, the amount of queries was smaller between one and six. And actually that was the time when I was uh, mostly in the office. And I realized that this is likely something that I am taking with me to the office. So doing a bit more digging, I was able to find what it was. This was actually an app called Wicker that I was using back then, um, which stopped working actually after I blocked sedgex or sesex.info in my DNS server. Uh, kind of mystery solved, I would say, it still gave me a bit of a panic um, as uh, it wasn't, I would say, very obvious. That it, was. it wasn't like a communication to weaker.com or even weaker.info. It was just to this uh, shady sesex.info domain with no who is or registration information about it. Yeah, um, well, case number two. So again, all this, uh, to be honest, I found them not by scripting, but I found them by just looking at the logs. If you remember what Rob Joyce was saying, someone paying attention to the logs can sometimes be quite powerful. So, as I was looking through the HTTP logs this time, I noticed that again, exactly every hour, you said like 338, 438, 538, 639. So there's like a very small delay and so on and so on. Every hour, there's an HTTP connection to an IP address. There's no host name here. So there was nothing in the DNS logs. And the path is something CGI being client CGI and some serial or indicator and the user agent was WGA. So again, something very shady happening every hour. Um, well, this, I would say was also very, very suspicious. So I started digging, uh, the connections were all to port 8,000. So I probed the host a bit just to see what's in the air. Um, it was basically uh, in South Korea, uh, the generic uh, KRNYC network. Uh, so not much, not much you can uh, discover from this, like who is actually, uh, behind this IP address and the traffic uh, happening in your home. And spawning, let's say, into the traffic, uh, um, well, I was able to find the reason for that. And uh, well, it was a network attached storage, an extremer network attached storage that I purchased a couple of uh, years ago. And I'm no longer using it, just in case you're wondering. What is interesting about this uh, network attached storage is that this function, this beam beaming to um, their, one of their command and control servers actually had a buffer overflow in it. So uh, with my uh, 
colleague Vitaly Kamluk, we reversed engineered the binary that was doing this traffic uh, on the NAS was running from Chrome hourly. And they were actually reading uh, data from a um, network socket onto a uh, buffer located on the stack that had a fixed size of about 200 bytes. So like super, super easy to exploit uh, for somebody who wanted, if they wanted, and they had access to the network traffic. Not to mention that uh, this could have been exploited very easily uh, uh, by the, obviously, by the uh, owners of this server. And there's, I know there's a, a question uh, from Dave um, in the chat. Hey, Dave, hope you're uh, doing fine. Thanks for joining the this uh, uh, opcode op uh, call. Um, uh, how many implants uh, actually add jitter to bypass statistical analysis of this type? Like uh, every hour plus minus rand of 30. Actually, I'd be surprised that uh, there are quite a few, um, especially there's quite a few of them when we speak about high-end APTs. So all high-end APTs uh, actually do that they do add this jitter and we've seen um, quite funny cases when uh, let's say the developers from a certain apt uh, they prefer let's say a very specific type of jitter and by just looking for that jitter code alone you can find more of their implants so on one hand, obviously, this can bypass or fool the um, statistical analysis. On the other one, uh, on the other hand, it can be helpful to catch the implants themselves. Um, yeah, so next time, I think, um, again, as I said, if Matt uh, wants to have me again, we can talk a bit about increasing the cost, uh, complicating targeting and uh, exploitation, which I guess are the next steps. Pretty much, uh, I guess, getting more visibility is the pretty much the most basic step that you can take uh, when you want to, uh, uh, let's say, to do a bit better. Just if you care about OPSEC, if you care about yourself getting attacked, the, the most basic step is to just for the record you're welcome uh, to come back in your home internet and in reality you don't know what's uh, flowing through your home internet link unless you tap it um, so i've been tapping my home internet now for um, about six years i guess and i can tell you that it can be done very uh, easily with a relatively simple hardware configuration. Uh, a lot of people are scared about doing this uh, in the sense, oh, we need to install Linux and we need to buy a hub. And uh, well, I can tell you that it can be done. I've been trying to convince Ryan Narain for many years uh, to do this for his home, still trying to convince him maybe one of these days uh, we'll be able to do it. But uh, I can guarantee that this offers a huge level of defense and awareness. Whenever there's some new report out there, um, whenever Kaspersky, Symantec, Trend Micro, whoever he said, uh, you name it, they published a new report about some significant threat, you can just take those indicators and then you search them back against your DNS logs, HTTP logs, NetFlow, and you can very easily say, if you have ever been affected by that threat or not. So far, I was not uh, able to find any APT attacks on my network. That doesn't mean, of course, that I've never been uh, attacked. I uh, Honestly, I do operate on the principle that my computer is owned by at least three APTs. So I try to combine, uh, let's say, having different computers, uh, having decoys, sometimes putting information there on the machine uh, designed to uh, deceive an attacker which has access or just to, uh, well, trigger a number of alarms and alerts. And one last thing that I would like to mention um, is that when you elevate the cost of SIGINT, remember that you will become a target for HUMINT. And that's pretty much all I have for today. Happy hunting, and I hope you guys uh, stay safe. 
both uh, in the cyber realm and against the uh, invisible enemy. Thanks, Kostin. Uh, uh, I, I just realized after I was uh, on mute on Zoom, but uh, you're more than welcome uh, to come back uh, anytime. And, uh, <laughs> apparently, uh, and, uh, we, we, we'll confirm after, but uh, it sounds like Ryan wants to uh, host and moderate uh, the next uh, Fireside chat, and uh, you will be speaking with, uh, with Dev if he's accepting. So that should be uh, quite interesting. <laughs> we, 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 we all know that uh, Ryan is a great moderator, so that should be uh, quite cool. Uh, yeah, I don't know if the chat has any more questions. At some point, uh, Dragos made a comment. He said you should use so Dualcom ETAP 2003 and uh, two non-real tech uh, USB free Ethernet adapters. So I don't <laughs> know if you can uh, say more about that uh, in the chat, but uh, yeah, that sounded uh, that sounded interesting. Although I don't know any of those devices, so we'll not be able to comment on that. Oh the, yeah. Um... A uh, shark tap is also a good choice. Um, I guess that the uh, old fashioned uh, hardware hub, so the hub that just does the uh, electronic uh, port mirroring is probably the safest uh, solution. Indeed, um, using smart switches can be tricky, uh, especially some of them get an IP address by the HCP. So there's absolutely like a quite a few tricky issues there but the old-fashioned uh, hardware hub <laughs> is the way to go for me so uh, yeah, a quick qu uh, question from the chat so you never found any a apt uh, in my home i in my home again i'm tapping my home so in my home i never found any apt uh, obviously we found quite a few apts in, in other places but at least in my home i haven't found any so far so far this doesn't mean again that i haven't been hit it just means that i need to work better at catching some yeah i mean like that's uh my following uh, question with that is uh since um everyone is working from home now like have you seen any like changes and uh in terms of like uh, the behavior of attackers because it does make sense now for attackers to actually target like people's home since uh well everyone is working from home right home is the office like when the mm -hmm. bringing on device was a big like p polemic no it's even worse it's like literally like working from home um well i guess that uh, the amount the overall amount of attacks um they're kind of now increasing so in particular when you look at attacks uh, related to things like uh, covid uh, keywords uh, then the number has been increasing uh, a lot since the beginning of uh, march yeah that's probably when the uh, spike began um, another thing was that we were uh, uh, kind of thinking that uh, probably a zoom zero day a zoom remote zero day would now be priceless for a lot of attackers yeah. uh, imagine what can be accomplished uh, with that so i'm also looking forward uh, to the next talk speaking about uh, zoom security the next, sub um, next update from zerodium on their table <laughs> yeah I, I wonder if zerodium will will push a uh, an update or notification in regards to uh, Zoom zero days. That would be interesting to see. I can always try to uh, invite uh, Shaoki for the next uh, roundtable uh, between uh, you and David. Uh, maybe we'd accept. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, I doubt so, but that would be uh, funny. Uh, another question from the chat, uh, one from Dave, if your house is in Moscow, uh, another one is a quick and dirty config to run uh, three catalogs through the free CTI. Um, so the first one home is in Moscow. No, actually I'm based in Bucharest. Um, I'm Romanian and I've been living in Bucharest uh, all my life. I've been to Moscow quite a few times, to be honest. Uh, um, it's beautiful. There are a lot of beautiful things to visit if you're into arts. Um, nevertheless uh, my home is in bucharest and uh, let me see what was the other question about is there Surika? quick and dirty config to run uh, three catalogs through uh, free cti 
Is there a quick and dirty config to run Suricata through FreeCD? I, I can't say, to be honest, because I I just built uh, all my uh, parsers myself, all the Suricata parsing and heuristics, I built them myself, so I can't say if, uh, if there's a quick and dirty way for that. Mm. And well, the follow-up question for that was like, does that make sense to do? Uh, it would just be too noisy. Um, I can't say again, uh, but I would say that the way to go forward is just a lot of uh, experimenting. So mm -hmm. I didn't know what uh, what kind of heuristics to build when I uh, started doing this. Um, it was all, you know, by ex experimenting, uh, looking at the logs with the naked eye, and then trying to build heuristics based on um, the observations and what looked suspicious in the logs. Uh, another question for Mian, uh, what's your opinion on using the following tools? Suricata for the IDS and uh, some IOCs and Zeek for network security monitoring and Rita for threat hunting in a home environment. What would be the hardware specs? Um, Can so you do that with an Intel NUC, I guess? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Like, um, to be honest, the last, the most uh, recent generation of Intel NUCs uh, is uh, quite powerful so uh, you can get one with an i7 uh, cpu um, well obviously you'll have to invest i guess the uh, investment would be something in the range of thousand uh, bucks for the uh, no, i7 nook and memory plus uh, an uh, ssd um, but again, I think it's a very worth investment. Uh, it will absolutely work. I can tell you that um, this also depends a lot on the network speed. So do you have a gigabit uh, network connection? Do you have a 100 megabits? Uh, if you have a 100 megabits, uh, you can do these things uh, even with a cheaper hardware, such as uh, maybe a, like a, a generic uh, 100 or $200 uh, mini PC you can get on Amazon will handle uh, 100 megabit traffic without problems. But if you want to do real-time gigabit uh, pattern matching uh, with Suricata, then you'll need the uh, high-end Intel NUC. Maybe we can get uh, Intel to uh, give away some uh, NUC uh, for the next edition. That would be a, a, a nice thing so we can build uh, some uh, home lab uh, to start tapping our homes. <laughs> I'm absolutely for you. And uh, yeah. Um, anything you want to add, uh, Kostin? I'm just checking if there is more question. I don't see any more questions so far. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Jeremy says uh, about uh, endpoint monitoring oh, uh, yeah. OS query. Oh, yeah, that's a brilliant idea. Of course, um, you want to collect logs from uh, all the endpoints that you have in the home. What I'm doing, I'm collecting both sys logs on the Unix and uh, Mac OS machines, and then I'm connect. I'm collecting uh, uh, sysmon logs from the Windows machines. Uh, it's very good just to collect, store them somewhere. Uh, if at some point you get compromised, uh, then you have information that you can sift through in order to find when it happened, how it happened, uh, what triggered the attack. Uh, all these key elements which can help you figure out exactly uh, what's going on and how you got compromised. Uh, I think we have another question also. Uh, I have another non-relevant question for Kostin from uh, Dave. Does he see a particular movement towards different protocols for C2, aka is DNS tunneling common or only HTTPS? Or dot, dot, dot. Um, well, uh, first of all, I want to say that Dave is asking all the right questions. So obviously he knows what he's talking about when asking these particular questions. I'm They're not, not sure just if the like right the dot, question. dot, dot is like the actual question <laughs> or if it's before. Uh, got it. But yeah, we, uh, we're seeing, we're seeing um, um, some, let's say, interesting protocols uh, such as DNS tunneling. Yeah, there's a number of APT groups like, uh, for instance, uh, oil rig or muddy water who like uh, DNS tunneling nowadays. Uh, you know, the plain old HTTPS is probably still a favorite. Uh, mm. Passive backdoors uh, are also kind of, uh, let's say, interesting. So when we speak about the truly high-end uh, threat actors out there, uh, they all 
kind of um, stand up for some, let's say, uh, particular features. So uh, one of them can be uh, passive backdoors. So for instance, passive backdoors that react to ICMP traffic or UDP traffic or even uh, HTTP traffic. So imagine dropping such a passive backdoor onto a web server and then doing all the CNS um, communication with the backdoor through HTTP requests into that uh, machine. Uh, but I would say that pretty much all the high-end actors are uh, have all sorts of tools in their toolboxes uh, that use additional protocols, um, even if HTTPS is probably still the most popular choice. Even HTTP is still a popular choice, but yeah. We do see uh, UDP-based communications. Uh, um, I'll give you another example. Recently, we did a, um, a red teaming uh, uh, pen testing exercise, and uh, we decided to use uh, WireGuard, um, which is a quite interesting uh, modern VPN, but it can also be used in a very sneaky way together with a Raspberry Pi. Uh, just to drop something into uh, a network uh, with the WireGuard VPN, it can be quite tricky to spot uh, if you don't know what to, to look for. Uh, <laughs> yeah, another follow-up question. What's the weirdest protocol uh, use you have seen so far? Um, what's the weirdest protocol? Uh, well, I, I would say there's maybe not necessarily the weirdest, but what's in my opinion, the hardest to catch is uh, Tor-based command and control. So there's a couple of backdoors out there uh, um, which use uh, a Tor-based CNC mechanism. So in that case, you just need to have a method of um, spotting Tor traffic from your home. And if you if you use Tor yourself, so if Tor is, let's say, legitimate traffic, then it can be extremely, extremely difficult to uh, identify a backdoor communicating uh, by Tor in your network. But yeah, there's, of course, there's a lot of exotic things out there. Um, there's probably many stories and there's many things we can uh, talk about here. I don't know if you have time, so maybe this is a good, uh, uh, question to answer the next time we speak about uh, OPSEC and increasing the cost of exploitation. Well, that's a good question for Arian uh, to mark down for the next uh, fire chat, you know, for in two weeks, <laughs> since uh, apparently Dev uh, says like two weeks is not enough to prepare like uh, slides for Keynote. <laughs> uh, another question, what's Suricata Beacon, uh, what uh, Suricata Beaconing detection techniques are on your top list, except time patterns and protocol abuse? Um, yeah, like I said, um, analysis of the um, uh, SSL certificates can be quite uh, productive in uh, spotting connections to, let's say, unusual places. Obviously, I don't want to give away all my tricks uh, because I'm pretty yeah. sure the, the APTs are listening. So <laughs> the APTs in the chat. <laughs> tomorrow, <laughs> they will uh, just simply... Uh, adjust uh, all their techniques uh, in order to avoid uh, the things that I'm talking about. So obviously this is something which I uh, already assumed when I put together this talk. Um, so yeah, with, without talking about everything, I would say uh, the SSL certificate analysis, uh, looking for traffic anomalies, uh, um, pretty much all sorts of uh, protocol anomalies that you can search for and unusual protocols such as ICMP, UDP, they are uh, in my, let's say, top three, top five. Cool. Uh, well, uh, thanks again for joining us, uh, Kostin. It was a real pleasure to have you and a uh, really you. interesting talk. And, uh, Thank you, man. I hope uh, Ryan is going to manage to convince uh, both you and Dave uh, for the fire uh, side chat for uh, the third edition of that uh, virtual conference that should be fun and uh yeah well uh, f f thanks again Kostin. yeah cheers thank you bye bye cheers take bye. care everyone
Yeah, good, good call, good call. I, f I forgot to unmute myself. Um, well, uh, welcome back, and uh, we're gonna get ready for our last uh, presentation from uh, Patrick. And that presentation is gonna be about uh, Patrick's latest uh, findings on uh, his uh, Zoom vulnerabilities. And uh, like Costing was saying, uh, very likely uh, Zoom and uh, probably all the platforms uh, probably going to appear on those lists uh, for like, uh, you know, uh, expensive exploits for re remote code execution. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. There is a 30 seconds delay, by the, by the way. Um, but yeah, so uh, again, uh, just a quick reminder. Uh, if uh, you're discussing uh, about the conference on Twitter, uh, don't forget to use the uh, OPCD 2020 hashtag. Uh, you're more than welcome to join us on IRC. The slides will be published after. And then also uh, the videos also will be on YouTube, uh, obviously. And uh, well, <laughs> lip reading. Uh, good luck uh, doing some uh, lip reading on a French person, you know. <laughs> but yeah. Well, uh, uh, that's uh, that's pretty much it. And uh, yeah, let me uh, just do that quick uh, transition and we can have uh, our last uh, speaker, Patrick. Social distancing, you say. The future is watching. Welcome to Opcode Virtual Summit. Uh, hi, Patrick. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, okay. Matt. How's it? Perfect. Aloha. Hello. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, thanks again for uh, joining us for your presentation. And uh, yeah, like uh, you, you, you're, you're live uh, now. So, you can go ahead. Great. First, I want to thank Matt for organizing this conference, uh, making it freely available and available uh, online. It's really, really cool. Also, thanks for the invite to talk about some of the Zoom vulnerabilities and issues that I discovered. So what we're going to talk about today are some flaws in the macOS clients. Uh, I published a blog post that has a lot of technical details, good diagrams and overviews. So we're going to kind of walk through that first. Um, and as that will allow me to explain exactly how I found the bugs and how to weaponize and exploit them. We're then going to switch and do a few demos uh, to kind of illustrate the impact of the bugs and also how a attacker or piece of malware uh, would go about exploiting these vulnerabilities. So I want to start by noting these bugs were in the, uh, at the time, latest version of the macOS client. Uh, both bugs were local bugs. Also, I think that's important to note because uh, you know, this would mean that uh, an adversary or a piece of malware would uh, need initial code execution on an infected system. Uh, but we'll see, though, that these bugs then give such an attacker or a piece of malware the ability to either escalate their privileges to root or surreptitiously access the mic and the webcam by piggybacking off Zoom's access. Uh, I also want to note that Zoom has released a patch for both of these bugs. Uh, they actually patched them within a day, so kudos to Zoom. So if you're using Zoom and are concerned about the security of the product, definitely download and run the latest version because there's lots of good uh, security goodness in patches um, in that latest version. So start with a bit of background talking about Zoom. And I think also this will shed light on kind of the platform as the whole, on, as, as the whole and also um, kind of why I got uh, inspired to look at the platform. So as I'm sure we're all aware, Zoom has become incredibly popular over the last uh, few weeks due to the uh, unfortunate uh, pandemic that's uh, impacting people all over the world. Uh, it's very common now for people to use Zoom, both for personal reasons, for example, to talk to their friends and relatives, uh, but businesses we're seeing also are now leveraging Zoom. Uh, there was a recent article a few weeks ago showing that uh, the UK government was actually using Zoom for uh, government communications. So, you know, obviously a very, very interesting target. And we take a step back and look at Zoom's track record. Uh, we can see that its privacy and security track record really wasn't that stellar. So 
let's briefly talk about some of the previous bugs before we dive into the ones uh, that I discovered. So first, uh, last summer, we had an issue where a researcher named Jonathan found a really nice remote uh, vulnerability in Zoom. Uh, in, in short, a malicious website could coerce a user's system to uh, turn on the webcam. Uh, so this obviously both a security and privacy concern. Um, you don't want uh, remote websites being able to turn on the webcam. And the flaw was because Zoom had installed. So the user had Zoom installed and somehow visited a malicious website. The uh, website could turn on the user's camera and, and spy on them, obviously. Less than ideal. Interesting fact about this vulnerability is that Apple actually pushed out an update via their malware removal tool, MRT, um, as a way to actually remove this vulnerable Zoom component from systems around the world. So interesting to see Apple both taking this action without uh, user consent um, and also using their malware removal tool to do that. So it was good probably from a security point of view because it uninstalled this insecure Zoom component that could be left running even if the user uninstalled Zoom. But again, I think it's some insight into Apple's capability and power and shows that at any time they can remove any program from your computer uh, without your consent. Moving on, uh, most recently we had an issue in the iOS application where uh, application Zoom specifically would send Facebook uh, data to Facebook, uh, even if you didn't have a Facebook account. From uh, really not a lot of security implications here, but more of a privacy issue. Uh, Zoom, as we note, was quick to patch this and basically said, hey, sorry, we're using this third party um, SDK, this framework. We weren't aware that you know it was basically tracking and sending this information. Um, so kudos to them for fixing this, but a little worrisome that they're compiling third-party frameworks into their code and not auditing and looking what these frameworks are doing. So these issues, these bugs, uh, I think were kind of illustrative of the approach uh, that Zoom had towards security and privacy, which was very lax, right? It really wasn't a priority. So I decided to kind of dig in and look at the map client, uh, especially after one of my um, friends, uh, Felix, another fellow security researcher, noticed that the installer did some uh, less than, I would say, up and up uh, action. So for example, it kind of uses some tricks on macOS to install itself with you actually not having to hit the install button. So I dove in and started looking at the Zoom installer. Uh, it's distributed as a PKG file. Uh, we'll show this in the demo, but you can use a utility such as Suspicious Package. It's a free online application that allows you to look at the contents of PKG files without having to uh, extract all the files or run the PKG file. So if we open this package, zoom.pkg, in the Suspicious Package uh, analysis application, we can see there's a variety of scripts that will get run when the user kicks off the installer. Uh, the pre-install script, this is a default script uh, that any PKG can add, and it will have commands that will be executed pre-install. That's why it's called pre-install. So we can see Zoom does a variety of things. Um, and basically, if we scroll down, um, or actually, I can show you this now. I think it's around, and this is a little hard to see, so I'll cut and paste this into a window. Um, Take any tech credit window. Run with root. We can see that this application is going to execute something called Zoom authentication. Zoom authentication tool run with root. And this is in order to install the application because perhaps the user doesn't have the access or the ability to write things directly to the application directly. So what Zoom is basically saying is, hey, we need to elevate our privileges so that we can complete the install. This is fairly common, right? The majority of installers oftentimes need to elevate their privileges to perform uh, certain privileged actions. Uh, but I've looked at a lot of installers and over the past uh, few years have found uh, it's difficult to do this in a secure manner. So once Felix uh, kind of noted 
that Zoom uh, as installer was, you know, kind of questionable, uh, maybe not written as well as it could. I wanted to dive in and see if I could uncover any flaws. So what we can do is we can look at this Zoom authentication tool because this is what gets executed to run run with root. We don't know what that run with root is yet, but we'll see in a minute. It's a, it's a script that gets run with root. Uh, we can hop over into a disassembler. And I apologize, this might be a little hard to see. Unfortunately, Hopper doesn't allow me to make this bigger. Uh, but again, I'll copy and paste this into the text edit window. Make this a little smaller. Uh, and basically there's a method called execute command. This is what that utility is going to execute. When we scroll down, really none of this matters except for the call to authorize execute with privilege. This is a well-known Apple API that an installer or an application can call in order to perform a authorized action. Uh, if you're familiar with the authentication prompt on your system, uh, you know, when you run an installer, it's possible that this API is responsible for that. So we hop back to the blog, talk a little bit about this API because it's unfortunately everywhere. And we'll see that it's a deprecated API, which can lead to problematic scenarios. So here's kind of a diagrammatic overview of the API. We can see, for example, it describes uh, the problem. Uh, and the problem is basically in a nutshell that it performs no validation on what it's about to execute. So a legitimate application can call this API and say, hey, please execute this script or this command for me with elevated privileges because I need to complete an install. The authentication will take care of the pop-up uh, and handling everything. And behind the scenes, we can see what it's going to do. It's going to basically call into this binary called security auth trampoline. This is a set UID binary that ships with Mac OS. And then once this application or this um, binary has successfully authenticated, meaning shown the pop-up and the user has put in their correct or an admin credentials, it will execute whatever the API was called with as root. But again, there's no verification. This is problematic because it means if a local adversary or piece of malware is on the system, if what is about to be executed is not adequately protected, meaning it's not uh, owned by root, uh, so it can be edited perhaps by that local unprivileged adversary or piece of malware, this API will naively and blindly execute it uh, with root privileges. So obviously an attacker can uh, subvert what is about to be executed potentially, and then uh, gain privileges as soon as that is uh, executed with root privileges. So we see Zoom is using this API. So the question is, is Zooming this insecurely? Securely? So if we run the Zoom package, we can see the authentication pop up. Uh, this is fairly standard. And if the user puts in their credentials, it's going to execute something behind the scenes. So we need to figure out what it's executing. And if whatever it's executing, a local unprivileged attacker can modify in the background to then add code or command to get that executed as root, kind of during the install process. So the easiest way we can do this, and we'll do this in the demo as well, we run a process monitor and we look for the execution of the security auth trampoline process. Recall, this is the actual Apple system binary that handles the authentication requests and ultimately executes with root privileges because it's owned uh, by root set UID, whatever the installer or application has specified. So in our process monitor, we can see that the command that's passed with is run with root. And this is not surprising, right? This is what we saw in the Zoom installer package. This is what it was executing. So this all lines up. So then the question then becomes, what is this run with root command script binary and can we modify it? So if we go back uh, or look closer at the install process, we can see that when the PKG is run, this run with root file is copied to a installer directory by the installer. And good news for us as a hacker or a unauthorized piece of power, this install directory is owned with root, sorry, with user permissions. So this means that the run with root bash script that is dropped by the installer and that will be run with root is not protected, it is editable by anybody 
as uh, anybody uh, on the system, even a, a user without uh, any special permissions. So what we can basically do, and here's a diagrammatic overview, is we can basically watch and wait for the Zoom installer or updater to be run. We can then detect when that run with root file has been created. And since it's created with just normal writable permissions by anyone, right? Just sitting in a temp directory, anyone can hop in and modify it. We can go in and then surreptitiously add some code or some commands. And then when that gets executed during the install process, whatever we've added to that command, sorry, to that script will be uh, executed. Because again, the authenticate uh, execute with privileges API does not validate what it's executing. So that's kind of the issue. That's kind of the flaw. So I'm going to are uh, on our sides. Let's see if we have this. Okay. See how the resolution is on this VM. Give me one sec. Okay, I'm gonna log in. My super secret password for the VM. Make it a little bigger. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to run a process monitor. And this is going to allow us to see and confirm what Zoom is running. So I'll make this a touch bigger. Okay, so the process monitor is running. We're now going to run the Zoom installer. Really tiny, I apologize. Uh, basically though, we're gonna click continue. Eventually, there's going to be an authentication prompt right here. This is Zoom asking for credentials, saying, hey, I need to uh, your credentials in order to complete the install. So we can go ahead here and authenticate. And then Zoom is happily installed. If we kill the process monitor and we look for this trampoline process, make this a little bigger here. We can see that as we talked about, and I showed in the blog, this security off trampoline process was exec to execute the run with root command. So this is just confirming, yes, in the background, Zoom is invoking this uh, insecure API uh, and executing this uh, run with root. We hop over to the install directory, com.apple.install this, uh, do an ls.lart. We can see that there is that run with root script that was dropped by the installer. And more importantly, the permissions on this file are uh, test slash system. And that's who I am running as just the default user. This is actually a standard user with no admin uh, privileges. So again, this confirms that Zoom is um, going to execute this file with root privileges. Um, we can actually confirm that if we hop back to the process monitor, we can see that bin sh bash is running with uh, UUID zero, it's running as root, and it's uh, executing the run with root. So security auth trampoline executes that. So what we're gonna now do is we're gonna show how we can exploit that. We're gonna add some commands to that run with root. And then during the install process, uh, we will hopefully pop a root shell. So let me just go ahead and delete this install directory. And let's kill Zoom. Okay, we don't need this process monitor. Uh, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop a root shell out of temp. So I just wanna show you that uh, LS, there's nothing in the temp directory standard stuff. We'll show there's a, a file that gets uh, dropped here. So what we're gonna do is run the Zoom installer again. We're gonna do this manually. Obviously we could do this programmatically. We're gonna go through, hit continue. It's gonna start doing its thing. Ask for its authentication credentials. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna take some commands to pop a root shell. We're going to CD into the installer directory. Um, we're gonna see that the run with root command is there. Um, we're running as a normal user, no privs, but we can edit this file. So we're gonna use Vim. And you can see, I am basically just copying a shell to the temp directory, setting it to be owned by root, setting the set UID bid and then executing it. So we're gonna save this. Some impressive uh, Vim skills. It's really all I know how to do. Um, come back, uh, we're gonna authenticate. Um, 
Zoom's going to install, and it's going to execute that uh, script that we've added those malicious commands to. And Zoom, go away. Uh, <laughs> demo gods are stoked. You can see who am I? We now have a root shell. If we look at the temp directory. We can see KSH is there, uh, LART, KSH, and we can see that uh, uh, yes, um, it's owned by root and it has the uh, set UID. Bin. So now we have a root shell that we can pop. Again, the attack scenario would be an unprivileged attacker or a local piece of malware that's perhaps running without root pr privileges. Um, what it's going to do is going to wait until uh, Zoom is run or the installer is executed and then can elevate its privileges to root using this attack. So that's kind of the first issue, uh, kind of neat logic flaw in the Zoom installer that allows uh, malicious code to elevate its privileges uh, to root. Now the next uh, local flaw that affects uh, Mac OS, let me just have some water. <clears throat> Uh, boils down to the fact that Zoom was compiled with an interesting, uh, let's say, exception that would allow malicious code to be injected into its trusted process space. And this was problematic because Zoom uh, is likely going to have access to the mic and the webcam. So in recent versions of Mac OS, imagine malware gets onto your system and perhaps it wants to spy on you, turn on the mic, turn on the webcam, um, you know, capture room, room audio, you know, see you walking around in your awesome objective by the C t-shirt. Uh, <laughs> and so it tries to access the mic or the webcam. Uh, Apple has added a great security feature on Catalina and maybe even uh, Mac OS version before uh, that basically shows, uh, will block that access until the user has explicitly approved this. And this was done to protect against uh, this exact kind of attack. So for example, when the user runs Zoom, this is legit Zoom, nothing suspicious is at this point. Uh, when Zoom goes to access the mic and the webcam, Mac OS is going to block that and then the user is going to have to approve it. Now, the majority of users that use Zoom are going to either give it access to the mic or the webcam. Otherwise, Zoom is essentially useless. So I, what I thought is, can I find a way to piggyback off uh, Zoom's ability um, in order to access uh, the, the mic and the camera via Zoom's uh, permissions? And as we'll see, the answer was uh, yes. So uh, popping down here, uh, the first thing we can do is we can check that Zoom is validly signed and it's compiled with something called the hardened runtime. So initially this appears problematic for us as hackers because the hardened runtime basically says, don't allow code to be ejected, injected into uh, whatever application is compiled with that. Uh, this is something I talked about uh, back at Zero Nights in 2016. At the time, Apple was not using hardened runtime. And so I said, hey, this would be a good idea. You know, it's something they were already doing on iOS. They should port this to Mac OS. Uh, not sure they were there and listening, but regardless, uh, recent versions of Mac OS, you can compile, compile applications with this hardened runtime. And you can determine that via the code sign utility. Specifically, you want to look for this right here, flags equal OX uh, 10,000. This is basically saying this application was compiled with the hardened runtime, uh, meaning local code malware attackers in theory should not be able to inject malicious code into this application. So it's a self-defense mechanism that applications can opt into at compile. So looks like Zoom did this. So far, so good. However, Zoom's security and privacy record has left a lot to be desired. So I said, I'm gonna just keep looking a little more because they've made a lot of missteps and so maybe there's more. So the next thing I did is I dumped Zoom's entitlements. Now, if you're not familiar with entitlements on Mac OS, uh, it's a way to convey additional information to the operating system uh, about what capabilities you want. So here, for example, we can see that Zoom has the entitlement to access the camera and the mic. And these are needed. Mac OS will still pop up and request the user, but you have to have these entitlements in order to even attempt to access the mic and the webcam. So this makes sense, right? Again, entitlements, uh, abilities that you want to convey to Mac OS. However, I scroll down a little further and I saw this very interesting entitlement. Com.apple security CS disable library validation. 
Apple documents this and it says it's a Boolean value that indicates whether the application may load arbitrary plugins or frameworks without code sign. Now again, I'm always thinking things from kind of this offensive point of view. And I said, okay, well, if Zoom has this exception to allow unsigned dynamic libraries, uh, perhaps I can get Zoom to load my own unsigned dynamic library, which normally should not be allowed because of the hard runtime, but because they have this exception, it might be possible. And then once my dynamic library is running in the process context of Zoom, in theory, I should inherit all of Zoom's permission, including access to the mic and the webcam. So that was kind of the idea and we'll walk through exactly how we achieve that. So we first need to figure out a way to get code executing in Zoom's context pro process. To add an additional dynamic library because Mac OS will validate the code signature. And if that is changed, it won't, for example, continue to give it access to the mic or the webcam. This is obviously smart. Otherwise you could just generically subvert uh, any application that the user had given access to the mic or the web webcam. However, I thought I might be able to use uh, an interesting dialib injection technique that's called dialib proxying. And I have a diagram right here. The idea is you simply replace a legitimate dynamic library that the application has a dependency on with your own, and then your own malicious library, you proxy any commands, for example, to functions or symbols to the original uh, dial dialog. And I have another diagram here, sorry for the scroll, uh, but when everything is said and done, this is I the idea. So we'll replace a legitimate dynamic library with our own. We'll add some compiler directives to redirect any requests for objects and functions to the original dialib that we've renamed, and then everything will seamlessly work with no problems uh, because the executable will naively load this. So uh, what we can do is we first need to find a dynamic library that Zoom depends on that we can rename. Now this is important because if it was only linked against system libraries, we can't modify those because those are protected with SIP, can't even rename them. Luckily though, we can see that Zoom exists or rather depends on this curl64 framework. And we can determine that by running the O tool command with the dash L flag, which shows you all the dynamic libraries and application is dependent on it. So wondering where is this curl64? Because what it is, it's uh, prepended with this at R path. So to figure out what this at R path is, it basically stands for runtime path. Uh, we can again run O-Tool with the lowercase l, looking again at the Zoom application, and we find this load command, this LCR path, and this describes what the R path, the runtime path, will be. And we can see it's going to be the executable path slash dot dot slash frameworks. So at runtime, this will get resolved to be the applications zoom.app contents macOS dot dot slash frameworks, which means it'll be in the application bundle content slash frameworks. And we can confirm that if we look at Zoom's application bundle, we can see, yes, indeed, there is this uh, framework and all these um, that Zoom will link. And we can actually do that here. I'll just show you again. Uh, if we come to uh, applications, do show package contents, we see, yes, there's the framework directory and there's that curl framework. Awesome. So this means we have a, uh, a directory with dynamic libraries and frameworks that Zoom is going to run that we can modify, right? It's not SIP protected, it's not owned by root, et cetera, et cetera. So what we can do is now we can drop a dynamic library in there, proxy one of the uh, legitimate ones there, and hopefully it will get loaded. I gave a talk about this. So if you wanna read more about uh, the run paths and executable paths, uh, check out the blog. So I targeted the lib SSL dialib. Uh, it's a standalone binary. It's just easier to modify than a full framework or a bundle. And uh, as I mentioned, the first thing is we need to rename this dialib so that we can plant our own to get that loaded. So what we do is we simply rename it underscore lib SSL 1.0. We could rename it anything. I just chose that. And then if we go and re-execute Zoom, we can see that the application immediately crashes. And this is actually a good thing because this shows it's trying to load the lib SSL dynamic library and it can't find it anymore. And this is shown in the image where it says the reason for a crash is image not found. And it references the lib SSL library that we've just renamed. 
So in theory, if we put our own dynamic library there and call it libssl 1.1.0, Zoom should run that. So we pop into Xcode, we create a simple dilib, it's unsigned, we add a constructor, we save it to the framework directory as libssl, and then we rerun Zoom. The good thing is our Zoom dialog will now get loaded, but unfortunately the application will immediately exit short, shortly thereafter. This is unsurprising because we've basically just taken a legitimate SSL library that likely had a bunch of required uh, SSL capabilities, functions, methods, et cetera, et cetera, and just replaced it with a vanilla, you know, bare, um, you know, skeleton based uh, dialog. So Zoom, you know, tries to call into it. There's no functions found. And, and so it gracefully handles that and exits. So now we need to go ahead and we need to implement the proxying. So anytime Zoom requests or needs SSL uh, capabilities and calls into what is now our library, we proxy it and forward that on to the original library so that legitimate functionality is maintained. So we don't break anything. So it turns out this is pretty easy to do. It's a very kind of neat trick. You can do it all with linker directives. So you don't have to rewrite any forwarding code. You basically specify a dash X linker flag uh, and then a dash re-export library flag, and then the path to the library that you have uh, reproxy. Now there's one more trick. There's one more thing you have to do. Uh, this creates a dialog that's almost ready for proxying, uh, but unfortunately some paths and names are going to be wrong. So you then execute the install name tool, and we'll show this uh, in the demo in a second. And we basically change the path so that it points to the original dynamic library that we've renamed. Because again, our goal is so that when the Zoom executable calls into the SSL library, it gets the original SSL library's functionality, right? We're just using the, the SSL to get ourselves loaded. We don't want to actually implement any SSL functionality. So once we run the install name tool command, we can look at uh, our malicious library. This libssl is not the original one. It's our malicious dynamic library. We can see that the loader, the linker, the compiler has created this LC re-export dialib load command. And this is what tells the runtime, hey, if you have a request for the libssl library, I don't know how to answer it, but I know who does. So please follow that. And this is the path to the dynamic library, the original one that contains the actual SSL functionality. So that's all you have to do. Uh, and once you compile and plant that dynamic library, we rerun Zoom and we can see, yes, indeed, Zoom has loaded our, our dynamic library into its process space. And since we are now running within the process context of Zoom, assuming Zoom has been given access to the mic and the webcam, uh, this malicious code can directly access the mic and webcam as well. Mac OS will see that request. However, it sees that it's coming from Zoom. Zoom's digital signature, it's binary on disk has not been tampered with. Uh, and so the request is allowed. So first and foremost, this means we can inject into legitimate Zoom uh, meetings and record both the room capture audio and the webcam, there won't be any alerts. Better yet, what we can do is we can actually execute Zoom in the background uh, invisibly at arbitrary times and leverage its access to turn on the mic or the camera whenever we want. So we don't actually have to wait until Zoom is running um, via the user to do this. We can execute this in the background. So the attack scenario would be malware gets on a system that wants to spy on the user via the mic or the webcam. You can imagine the UK government is using Zoom. Uh, Zoom's running on their systems. Malware, once it gains access, can just run Zoom in the background and then turn on the mic and listen to whatever is being said uh, in the UK government, you know, hear them all complaining about what a stupid idea Brexit is um, and can capture that without any uh, indications, right? No pop-ups from, from Mac OS. So that's kind of a, a, an interesting attack scenario that uh, I could see uh, attackers or malware perhaps leveraging um, in the future. So to test this uh, in my malicious dyna dynamic library, when I named libssl, I added some code to just capture some audio and mic off the webcam, just five seconds of doing that. Standard mic webcam access. Compiled this in, if I ran this as a standalone, Mac OS would block this and show an alert to the user. But since the dynamic library is running within the Zoom process space, I was able to run, no alerts, capture the picture of my lovely dog. She's actually the brains behind all of this. 
So uh, let me just pop over and show some of the code and examples for that second attack. Uh, unfortunately, I can't, I was gonna do a live demo, but we're using Zoom for this. <laughs> and so <laughs> to do this, uh, <laughs> I would have had to, you know, restart Zoom and then kill this session. Um, but I'm actually, it's kind of funny because I'm actually proxying this. Uh, I ran this attack right before I, I joined the, uh, the Zoom call to present this to you all. Uh, and so this instance of Zoom actually has an instance of my malicious dynamic library running and is doing all the proxying. So <laughs> I actually never tested it fully. I mean, I ran the app and I was like, hey, yeah, nothing crashes. Um, but this was kind of an end-to-end, -end, the first end-to-end -end tests. Um, <laughs> of the the proxying and then you know so far appears uh, so good so this is the dynamic library this is the uh constructor constructor will be automatically invoked uh anytime the by a piece of malware in the background uh, in this hidden kind of version this uh, code inside the dynamic library will get loaded so we just print out a message and then we instantiate a video snap object this is just uh, some standard code I wrote to capture um, uh, video and audio off the, the webcam. So if we look at the compiler directives, the linkers, we can see here we have the xlinker and the slash uh, re-export uh, library command that I specified earlier. Um, and then once we copy this uh, into Zoom's application bundle, this dynamic library will get automatically loaded. Um, and if we go over to console here, we can see that Zoom uh, did load this uh, dynamic library and the print statement that we saw uh, was displayed uh, to the screen, confirming that it was uh, loaded. I think, um, if I come over here, would access now. No, this is another window. Um, and, and then once it's loaded uh, by, by Zoom, obviously, as we talked about, it can access the, the mic and the webcam. Uh, and of course, do anything else that Zoom does, right? It's running in the address context of Zoom, um, so it has access to anything that Zoom has. And, and just to reiterate, the way this was all possible was because of this uh, disable library validation key that Zoom, uh, for some unknown reason, reason, added to their application. Uh, it's basically an exception to the hardened runtime that tells Apple Yes, I want to opt into the hardened runtime, but I'm okay letting any third party code running in my address space. So if you wanna look for other vulnerable applications, either look for applications that are not compiled with the hardened runtime um, or have this exception in entitlement. And then this means you can load arbitrary dial dialibs into their process space. And if that application does something interesting or has some access that you want, for example, access to the mic, the webcam, uh, keychain, user photos, access to the network, et cetera, et cetera, you gain access. So this is actually a very powerful technique that goes way beyond Zoom because first and foremost, it's kind of a great way to get persistence, right? Say you can do this to some browser, anytime the user starts the browser, your dynamic code will get run as well. So if you're a backdoor or an implant, this is a very stealthy way to um, gain access uh, and, and persistence, right? You're not gonna show up as a new process, you're not creating a new launch daemon, a new launch agent. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, detect uh, against this. And then again, imagine, you know, just a great way to get into applications. Uh, if the browser, for example, or Zoom is able to access the firewall uh, or has a rule to get through the firewall, you are running in that process context, you will also be able to get uh, that access. So I'm really surprised attackers don't make more use of this dialib proxying uh, attack scenario uh, because it's very stealthy and very powerful and affords you a lot of uh, capabilities, a lot of access. Now, the good news is, uh, you know, I don't oh, just break things. Uh, I also write free uh, security tools that can help protect against this. So the first one is oversight. Oversight will tell you anytime the mic or the webcam is activated, uh, regardless of what permissions it has and if Apple has approved it. So this could potentially detect the attack scenario where the user, sorry, the uh, a malware took uh, Zoom and is running it in the background with an ejected dialib to access the mic and the webcam. Of course, it will show up as Zoom, but you know, imagine you don't expect Zoom to be running and your mic is on via this attack, uh, you will be alerted. Another tool I write is Knock Knock. Uh, this enumerates for persistence uh, and uh, last few years has also had the ability to detect these proxy dialibs. So if an attacker is using this proxy dialib, 
uh, attack to thwart Zoom or any other application to either stealthily gain persistence or install a backdoor and implant. Knock, knock can generically find these proxy dialibs. Um, and so here, for example, after I installed uh, my proxy dialib to subvert Zoom, ran knock, knock, we can see it detects that there is this proxy dialib that's you know unsigned, unknown by virus total. And obviously, if you were a you know a forensics investigator at this point or a malware analyst, you should take a closer look at that dialib to make sure it's you know, or figure out a, a, exactly what it is. So that is a wrap. I believe we have a few minutes for some questions. Uh, so if there's any uh, questions, we can chat uh, about any of this. Yeah, definitely. Um, well. One of the question uh, was like, uh, we can obviously tell that uh, Patrick uh, pre-recorded this presentation. So uh, if you have any question, <laughs> we, 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 like we have the proof, uh, it's live, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, it's live 100%. No, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I've just, you know, dosed so many of these that uh, <laughs> um, yeah. it works. No, and the VM is not a recording that was live. Um, like yeah, I yeah. said, I really wanted to demo the injection attack, but I realized like right before starting this, I was like, oh wait, I'm gonna be using Zoom. So if I restart this uh, it's gonna be problematic so no, uh, I'm, I'm if, you, if you make it crash that could be quite uh, quite funny though <laughs> <laughs> i would be amused but i think all the users would be like oh and there goes patrick no, no that's fine uh well uh, before we get any question in the chat uh like how long did it take again for zoom to fix those those vulnerabilities i remember they were like pretty uh pretty quick no yeah, and that's actually something I want to focus. So thanks for bringing uh, that up because Zoom did an amazing job uh, patch, patching these bugs. So I posted the details of these bugs on the blog. I hadn't disclosed them to Zoom. Uh, my justification or my reasoning was that uh, these were local vulnerabilities issues. So an attacker would obviously have to have, uh, you know, um, already have some access uh, yeah. to, to the system. Um, also, I really just wanted to bring broader awareness to Zoom's lack of privacy and security. And uh, I think myself and other security researchers that were pointing out these flaws did a really good job driving that home. Um, and to Zoom's credit, they fixed uh, both of these bugs and a myriad of other bugs reported by other security researchers in one day. I mean, that is, that's yeah. incredible. Like for a vendor's point of view, that's amazing. Not only that, they very proactively uh, really took a step back and said, hey, we now fully understand we have a privacy and a security problem. Like we understand, unfortunately, we didn't prioritize that from the beginning. You can't blame them too much, right? Silicon Valley startups, the goal is to basically gain the most possible number of users uh, so that you become very important and widespread and then, you know, be acquired or uh, IPO and make billions of dollars. Uh, and so the problem with that approach is, yeah, that's the best way to make a lot of money, but it really puts security and privacy on the back seat because, yeah. you know, and imagine a company spends three months on a new version of a product and says, Hey, there's no new features, nothing changed, but this version is more secure. Like customers yeah. and users just are not going to care. So, yeah. you know, zoom and all these other companies prioritize new features. Hey, look, we have new and emojis and users are like, oh my God, I want that. And they will upgrade or pay for those new features. You know, these companies make more money, get more users. And meanwhile, security and privacy really kind of, it's just an afterthought or no thought at all. Zoom though really kind of took a step back at this point and said, hey, uh, we need to really need to focus on security and privacy. And so what they promised to do is a feature freeze, put all engineering resources uh, on uh, security and privacy issues. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, bring in uh, third party security researchers, do pen tests, improve their bug bounty program, uh, have an external CISO board reviewing a lot of their decisions. So, you know, moving forward, I'm very optimistic that Zoom will get their act together. Um, and I think they're doing this not just because it's best for uh, their users, but it's also what's best for them, right? They're, they're yeah, definitely you know, potentially losing customers uh, because, yeah. you know, privacy and security it is important to a lot of uh, companies. So the good thing is, is by them now making security and privacy a priority, that's really a win-win, right? End users around the world will have a more secure product and mm -hmm. Zoom will get more com companies and clients. Um, so kudos to Zoom for really taking this seriously and moving forward. I'm very optimistic that they will really uh, kind of get their act together in terms of uh, security and privacy. Yeah, it's true. The, the, the response so far has been uh, pretty good because uh... I think it was you, uh, your blog post, the other one about the UNC path. I think the article from The Intercept also like uh, 
which was based from the Citizen Lab blog post, I think, about the encryption. I think they're getting a lot of heat at yeah. the moment, so they definitely need to show that they are investing internally on security. Um, yeah, and like I said, I think they are. The CEO reached out to me personally. Thank you oh, for wow. my finding. Um, have, this also, have this a, actually cool. have a Zoom meeting with him later today. And so as a security researcher, like that really like floored me because first and foremost, you know, when you yeah. report bugs or post bugs on your blogs, vendors usually, you know, either yeah. ignore you or, you know, threaten legal action or, you know, yeah. the, the CEO never, let's just say Apple has never responded as like positively uh, as Zoom yeah. knows. So, um, so that was, that was, that was eye opening. And uh, like I said, so I think I'm moving forward. I'm very optimistic that, that's pretty awesome yeah definitely improve their security and privacy posture so uh, again really it shows a lot of emotional maturity um from zoom's point of view so just kudos kudos again to them yeah definitely uh some more questions from the chat uh do you think zoom hired former uh, slayer creators i'm not sure uh, what slayer if so <laughs> is it a modern way to make your career path in cybersec so Schleyer is a oh, Schleyer, yeah. popular piece of uh, adware, malware, uh, and the way it elevates its privileges is by showing an authentication prompt. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I doubt it. Um, the unfortunate reality is that API is just very commonly used because uh, one, it was kind of the recommended approach by Apple. And unfortunately, the more modern APIs that Apple provides to securely perform privileged or elevated actions are incredibly complicated. Uh, you have to set up an XPC service and you have to um, install a launch daemon that then you have to manually uninstall. You can't pass command line arguments. Like it's totally doable and it is secure. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a ton of work and very difficult. So this uh, everyone generally defaults back to this uh, off uh, execute with privileges API because it's just so much simpler uh, to use. Uh, so that's malware authors and also uh, developers. Um, so I don't think Zoom <laughs> hired uh, the malware authors. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know who the malware authors are, um, but we see a lot of legitimate um, companies. I mean, Chrome for a long time utilized this API too, and they still mm. might. They said it was a not. They they basically said it's a, a won't fix when I reported it because they said the the alternatives are are uh, not valid. Uh, Sparkle, the very popular uh, update platform that a lot of applications are compiled with, um, I believe, still does as well. So uh, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's very widespread. Uh, awesome. Uh, another question. Is it possible to detect Apple's use of MRT client side uh, or over the network? Yeah, so uh, MRT is Apple's malware removal tool. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting to monitor for a variety of reasons. First, Apple a lot of times detects new malware and doesn't tell anyone about it. I uh, don't really share this with the antivirus community or security researchers, which I personally think is is a re really poor approach. I mean, sharing is caring, kind of all in this together. Yeah. So one way to get really information about, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> That's a separate topic though. <laughs> Stay focused, Patrick. Uh, so uh, MRT is great to monitor because uh, a lot of times you can gain insight into the signatures in the malware that Apple knows about by um, monitoring that. Um, also, in the case of Zoom, the fact that they use this technology to basically re uh, remove legitimate third-party code uh, is, is, is super interesting. Yep. So um, unfortunately, the easiest way to monitor MRT for, for updates is, is basically to monitor the binary itself, because actually Apple compiles a signature into the MRT binary. Um, and so if the binary changes, there's a new version change, uh, it's a good idea to basically pop it in a disassembler and start looking through that. Um, so, you know, you can set a, a watch path on that or have a file monitor running, basically looking for, for, for updates. Um, the other thing I think you can do is you can, you can, uh, ping Apple's, uh, update catalog and they have the latest version. And so just make a web request. And if that version changes, you know, that there's been an update. Now, in terms of monitoring its activity on the system, that's difficult because there's not like an MRT log file. It doesn't say, hey, I just removed Zoom. Um, I believe there's some diagnostic logs you can dig around and find, but you know, Apple barely likes to admit the existence of MRT because it acknowledges that there's malware running on the system. Mm -hmm. And if they use it to do things like remove Zoom, that's not something they want to talk about either. Yeah. So this is why generally it's difficult to uh, monitor both for updates and to monitor its its activities. Uh, but yeah, it would be great if Apple provided a little more transparency here because 
you can imagine a, a Maxis admin wanting to know, hey, you know, are there any systems on my network that you know MRT detected the remove malware for? I think that's a very valid question, but. Uh, Unfortunately, I don't see Apple <laughs> yeah. changing their course on that, but I'll keep bugging them about it. Yeah. Well, I still never got my, uh, you know, like the signing certificate for my driver, by the way. So <laughs> I, I pretty much gave up uh, to do anything with Apple. You know? <laughs> I but know. Yeah. I mean, like yeah. memory forensics, very, very important. Yeah. Uh, but they're just like, no. But it's, de it's dead now. Like they, no one, they killed all the kernel extensions anyway. So. <laughs> Yeah, they yeah. did. And we see attackers using in memory only uh, attacks and exploits and this third party security tools like there's literally no way to uh, detect that. And to me, that's mind blowing that, uh, you know, techniques that atta attackers are publicly utilizing uh, that Apple has basically taken away the capabilities of security tools to detect and thwart that um, mind blowing. But, you know, Apple knows best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, uh, thanks for uh, joining us, Patrick. Uh, it was really awesome to uh, to have you here. Uh, like, uh, well, tonight, I guess, this morning for you. And, like, you <laughs> it's still like early morning in a way. Uh, but yeah, uh, thanks, awesome. Also, it's great to have you uh, speaking at Opcode again because, uh, like, uh, unlike Ryan, you know, would uh, decline the <laughs> some of the invitation before <laughs> built on some invitation. You actually spoke at Opcode uh, in Dubai. It's great to have you back. Uh, and I got to ride camels. I was really excited about that. <laughs> yeah, I remember I saw your pictures. It was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, and I just want to say thanks again for organizing this, uh, both in the past, amazing conference. Any of you listening, uh, Upcode's an amazing conference, both to attend and speak at in Dubai. Great place to visit. Um, and Matt, I know how much work goes on organizing a conference, making sure everyone shows up when they say they will. Uh, so thank you too for, for organizing this and making it uh, available online. Because I think uh, as researchers, the bugs we find, you know, I think that's interesting, but us being able to disseminate that information to a broader audience, I yeah. think really moves the security of platforms and products forward. So uh, yeah, thank you, I really appreciate it. Uh, well, uh, yeah, th uh, thanks to you. Uh, the, the format is going to be uh, like every two weeks anyway. Like the next edition is going to be 22nd of April. So, yeah. Can I come back? <laughs> if, if you want to, yeah. If you have anything to talk about, like Costin is actually coming back. He's probably going to do a fire chat with uh, well, with Dave Etel, actually. Like we, we, we'll see. Like uh, it's still uh, a discussion, but <laughs> it, it's just well, happening in the chat, in, you know. In... So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, well, thanks again. And everyone who's watching, mahalo, really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully when this is all over, we'll all grab beers and uh, reconnect in person, IRL. Awesome, take care, bye. All right, thanks Matt, bye. Well, uh, hi everyone and uh, welcome back. So this is uh, finished for today. So we're pretty much done. Uh, for today i hope you enjoyed uh, today's edition uh like i was saying before let me just pull that slide uh, quickly uh but yeah the next edition is going to be on the uh second of april and uh, 22nd of april sorry and uh, yeah if you want to like speak if you have anything to speak at the cfp is still open there's the link on the website uh and uh, yeah, if you have any recommendation for a speaker, like do not hesitate to reach out. Uh, format is going to be the same. So alpha day, uh, because it's morning time, like on the West Coast. Uh, and here it's not too late. Um, and uh, yeah, alpha day every two weeks. And that's it's then slides on YouTube, uh, slides on uh, GitHub. And then the presentation is going to be cut and pushed on uh, uh, YouTube also after um any comments or feedback uh for uh, for next edition or this edition um i see there's a lot of people like coming back from last edition uh well thanks again for the support uh first of all i know a lot of you are like watching for a bit everywhere um uh, uh, wh 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 whichever country you're from you know like nah, don't hesitate to just like type it in the chat you know it's also good to have some uh, some visibility on uh, where you are connecting from uh like uh, one of the things also that came out today is the need to, uh, you know, to have a better platform to communicate our ideas. And since now there is no conferences, so I think like moving virtual uh, makes sense. And a bunch of, uh, I'm sure we're gonna see a bunch of virtual conferences like uh, pretty much uh, soon. Uh, 
but also to have a place where we can archive like all the research uh, that that uh, you know like that we all have to present. Uh, I think it's uh, also pretty uh, important uh, because everything is a bit scattered like uh, ev everywhere, and uh, because also like now like. Uh, with the, because of the pandemic, a lot of like uh, research topics are like moving very quickly also. So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty good, I think, in my own opinion, to have like a platform where you don't need to wait uh, for uh, three months, you know, to get an answer from a CFP and then uh, get to, to present also. So I, I think overall it may, it may even be like a, a, a you know, pretty good like a platform too. Because uh, then you have like the blog posts that are like pretty good, but sometimes, you know, it's also good to have um, an actual like a, uh, like a video presentation uh, where you can uh, speak about things. Um, but uh, yeah, like uh, you can either like uh, reach out to me directly, privately, you know, just like ping me on, uh, on Twitter if you have any comments. Uh, yeah, don't hesitate to use like the uh, the, the hashtag upcut 2020 uh, Juan, if you're watching, I think uh, if I had any prize to give away today, I think uh, you would be receiving that prize for being the most uh, uh, active person uh, on uh, on social media and uh, and supporting uh, the the conference. So uh, thanks to you, uh, Juan. Uh, thanks to all the speakers uh, today. So uh, for for speaking today. So uh, Ryan, Sarah, Grok, uh, Brian, Costin, and Patrick. Uh, thanks again uh, for accepting to speak. Uh, also on uh, such a short notice. I know it's not uh, very common either, but I think overall the, overall we have like some uh, pretty good uh, content uh, today uh and uh yeah so Matt, what do you use to uh, stream live on youtube uh i'm, I'm using like some uh, like streamer uh, software called obs it's usually uh, used by gamers so i see you can also do uh, conferences with it um but yeah and uh yeah any any questions uh I see everyone uh, is saying uh, like good things. Cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, Th thanks again. And uh, I guess that's it uh, for today. Bye, everyone. Social distancing, you say. The future is watching. Welcome to Opcode Virtual.